Defining Duke, an Xbox podcast is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support the show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Salutations, everybody. It is Maddie here today, and welcome to episode 201 of Defining Duke, a Xbox podcast. Today, I am joined by the Shinobi, Lord Cognito. How are you today, good sir? Doing good. I'm doing good. Tired, mm-hmm. <laughs> but good. Just mm-hmm. a lot going on. Nothing's crazy. going on this week, bro. What are you nah, talking it's, about? You know, it's the most crazy, quiet week in, 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 in the whole world, right? right? There's nothing going on this week. <laughs> <laughs> bro someone sent me the funniest gif i don't know if you see my timeline and it's the metaphor and yeah you i know you played a little yeah. bit i'm assuming at this point yeah. there's the iconic thing that's in metaphor that people know about as far as candidates yeah and it's just the funny story is i'm playing metaphor during an election it's wild. bro it, i was seeing it to lily last night i was there was lines getting ripped and i'm like i think i just saw this on like twitter a couple of days ago i was like you know playing this game while i'm watching the election results in real time unfucking believable believable yeah bro, unbelievable that was I, a experience i will always remember i was like I can't believe just how like yes. well this is marrying real life. It's it's art insane. imitating life. Like like it's this. It's a wild time to be playing this game at yeah. this exact moment. Yeah. But other than that, being tired a little bit, running around. Oh, mm-hmm. um, I'm hanging in. I'm hanging in, man. It's just so much going yeah. on. But how you doing, man? How, how we feeling? Doing good. Wanted to give yeah. some love to our yes. fellow Dukes the LSM audience. Uh, let's use the write in here from Jace Tomolovich because it made me write. It made me laugh. And he said, "Maddie, I just want to say I'm proud of you sur- for surviving your attempted cancellation and character assassination. When we do cancel you, I want it to be for pushing Sonic on the community, not lies and slander. Have a oh, we'll get him, but not like that." <laughs> 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 yeah. He's like, this is how we're gonna get him. Not, not this way, but this way. Yeah, I look, I don't want to make it all about me, but I just want to take a moment to thank everyone. Like I I, you know, after healing a little bit, man, I took some time to just dive online. I, I did my thank you tour, as I already said last week, but then I, I I took a took a gander at the comments. I just, you know, you gotta feel out the community sentiment. I don't believe in the idea of like completely ignoring what everyone has to say online. And so I was like, okay, let me just even if I disagree, like let's see what people got to say. And LSM fam, just thank you for showing up. I mean, I saw it on Constellation, Sacred Plus, Summon Sign, Duke. Like, the comments were really just supportive of me. Um, and, and and this was like before anything happened. Like, where it like just thank you. You know, thank you for being there. Thank you for for making this recovery a lot easier. I'm doing a lot better this week, man. This is the it, it's so it's funny. Energy's just, better. Yeah, it's just much better. I, it's like yeah. I blinked and it's mm-hmm. been a week, but. Um, you know, it just feels like things are settling down. I'm getting back into my rhythm. I got my appetite back. I'm exercising nice. again, like just getting a degree of normalcy back. But a big reason why I was able to get back on my feet beyond all the people in my personal circle really was the audience. Just thank you for having my back, for 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 cheering me on there. That was immensely helpful and not losing hope. So just yeah, I, I appreciate it immensely. Uh thank you for taking the time to write in and um Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I can't yeah. say it enough. It just it made a huge difference. Thank you. Always, always know when the real ones come yeah. through, got your back during the adversity. That, that's when it's beautiful. Absolutely. 100%. Shout out to the realm of the Dukes. Yeah. LSM fam, too. At the same time, I'm learning certain people who have blocked me <laughs> in light of all this. And there's some that I saw that one of them in particular, I won't, I won't name names, but one in particular, I'll tell you after the show, I was like, Man, really? I was like, we caught a block. Yeah, I caught, I caught a few blocks for sure. Um, and, and by the <laughs> way, this is happening in nature of me not searching these people up. Mm-hmm. I'm like researching for videos and like, I was like, oh, like this name here. And it goes to their profile where I'm like going to try to look at the statement. I'm oh, that's, it says wow. you are blocked. I'm like, well, okay. shucks. That's, that's All a, right. that's a shitty way to learn that. But nonetheless, um, I, you know, it's going to happen. It's mm-hmm. all good. Um, we, le- we learn. We do learn. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, just again, thank you to the audience. Appreciate everyone writing in, giving some kind words. Hope mm-hmm. everyone out there is doing well. And if you want to support us, Head to patreon.com slash last stand media early ad free access goes live on Thursdays. Otherwise, we hit free feeds on Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, and plenty more on Sundays. You can see us on the Last Stand Media YouTube channel if you so desire to see our faces, which 
you know what I was thinking about the other day, Cog, is that there's people who just like listen to us Mm -hmm. and that's it. Like they don't know what we look like. And oh yeah, that's true. And, like, you know, I, I think that, we yeah. had that. At, like, I don't know if it was this past live show, but mm-hmm. people who were just like, "Oh, I'm seeing you guys for the first time." Like, I only listen. I'm like, "How'd you find us then?" Like, that is so wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shout out to Spotify, now, right? You yeah. know, what I'm saying as far as you know, the audio listening community and stuff like that. And it, it is interesting because I'm like, we do so much with our faces and gestures and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I always put, try to put myself in the mind of the audio listener. Well, you actually do a better job than me of always saying, hey, for our audio listeners, this is what's going oh. on. And you'll get proper context, you know, saying kind of thing. But that's nah, It is interesting, the form of consumption. And there are people who tell me like, hey, love you guys or even ILP, but you know, you draining the battery on my phone with this video, so I have to listen to audio, or, I, or I'm a truck driver, or I work a night yeah. shift, and I get it. So in yeah. that sense, there's always going to be that level of consumption. For sure. But we, we thank you for listening wherever you do listen. Uh, again, everything linked down below if you want to go ahead and check it out. But otherwise, Cog, let's get in some new, into some news here. Uh, it is a very busy week in gaming. A lot of little tidbits here. First one, though, that I wanted to get into is a brand new creative director for Perfect dark uh this is also extremely interesting information given what it means for playstation as we'll get into here because game file has reported that brian horton creative director at insomniac who spent significant time on wolverine has now taken his talents to the initiative to work on perfect dark it is said that creative differences led to horton to uh leaving his current position for a new one and it becomes even worse for wolverine as the game has also lost its director in cameron christensen though he will be remaining with the company um, Brian Horton's an awesome dude. He actually reached out to me when he saw my Indiana Jones uh, retrospective go live on Retro Rebound, and he loved how I was like going through the manual and like he saw he, he like he was sharing memories of like how distinctly awesome it was putting that together. If anyone's not seen that video, and you want to know what manual I'm talking about? It's for Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb. It's like built like Indy's uh, journal, and it's it's got so much detail, so many cool ideas, so many little notes. Like it's a it's one of the perfect game manuals out there. And the game is awesome too. So mm. he's a great dude. And uh, it's interesting to see him kind of, if you will, for lack of better terms, switching teams. Uh, this is obviously an indicator that something's going a little south with Wolverine. We don't know exactly what, except created differences. Uh, but we're seeing here that this is a pretty significant hire for Perfect Dark, which we saw gameplay of this year and looks really good. So, Cog, what are our thoughts here on what GameFile has reported? Yeah, this was a surprise to me because, um, you know, like you said, I mean, now you got to send me that video. I'm, now you got to be like intrigued. I'm like, oh, wow, that you did that. With, yeah, send that to me. I want to check that out. But, um, yeah, Horn is, is is one of those guys, man. He's a legend out here. And um, people forget, like, he worked on the Tomb Raider reboot. Mm. He was part of um, Infinity War from the old days as well. He's got tremendous chops. So, and look, Insomnia, we, we know, like, if you want to look at the PlayStation Studios, you can make the argument. If it wasn't for Insomniac, like, where would they be, right? Yeah. So to hear this about Wolverine is a little concerning to me because, look, if somebody, this, this is how I look at it. Normally, someone gets a bag. They're like, yo, you got a bag. Xbox, do you know, you're going to go over there. No big deal. Uh, that happens in the industry. The key that got me is the second creative director who is still with the company. Well, this is just the games director, bro. Like, games dire- top yeah. level. Yeah. yeah. And now is to the, to the side. That guy who's been pushed out of his role, but is still with Insomniac, that to me was a little bit of the red flag. And then in conjunction, now the Ratchet and Clank directors are now controlling the project for Wolverine. Mm. So, yeah, it's 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 a little shaky, in my opinion. And then the other thing is, in defense of Insomniac, bro, that whole game got leaked. They were people yeah, playing sure, sure copies, so about. bro. That was awful so you got that whole thing the direction the story characters i saw i saw all types of who the you know extra you know protagonist was yeah you know we saw it all so i I feel for that team but it does lead me to believe that development there is an issue and you know as far as xbox is concerned now on their side obviously things ain't all rosy with them in the beginning with the initiative because it was super shaky when they they hired all this talent Mm -hmm. remember and Mm -hmm. then all them left out the door, and then the people with the Crystal D shirts came in. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Crystal D, we're here for Gallagher. Like, okay, what's this about? Like, <laughs> this seems like development hell to me, too. I'll be the first to yeah. admit. Like, yeah. that studio, before we saw it recently, we were like, what is going on with mm-hmm. the initiative? Right? Mm-hmm. The, how many A's you had mm-hmm. and all that other stuff. Mm-hmm. So, to me, 
what's saving, I would say saving, but what we've now seen, what we have, we have some type of concept of vertical slider. We're like, okay, that looks good. So it seems like they're further along. And then hopefully, you know, Horton, that's a huge get. That's a yeah. huge get. So, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm pull, pulling for both teams. You know, sure. um, obviously Wolverine and Insomniac, yeah. that's, that's a huge get. And um, obviously Perfect Dark looked really impressive. So yeah. I hope Horton can help them get across the finish line and give his tremendous experience to initiative. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think uh, right now I'm going to give Insomniac the benefit of the doubt. They've more than earned that, right? So even if there's creative differences, they haven't delivered something really bad in a while like what since fuse i guess and you like can make, even yeah. fuse was like kind of a guilty pleasure it might have been like one of the random ratchet and clank spinoffs they did on the ps3 and even then like so much of that talent's really not there anymore so um i'm giving them the benefit of the doubt you got to wonder if at the heart of these creative differences does lie a level of like our whole game leak do we want to change things like I, I mean i i don't know if that's exactly the case but i i wonder if that's a conversation that happened there like hey everyone not everyone but a lot of people know our story we saw how that went for the last of us part two. Like, you know, do we want to put ourselves through that again? Uh, it, it was probably a unpredictable, uncomfortable spot for them to be in there. Um, so on that level, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, but uh, for Xbox to get a talent like this is definitely huge. I mean, again, when I look at projects that lose their creative de- directors, lose their directors, I think of like halo infinite. I think of uh dragon age. Like I, I think of these games that, Maybe for many are not an indictment of the end product being bad because I think Halo Infinite turned out solid enough. Could have been better in some ways for many people. Not all. Definitely not me, though. Dragon Age turned out solid despite a long development timeline. So it's not an indicator that the end product, the end result is going to be very bad. But it does mean that there is some sort of trouble happening right now if, you know, patterns we've seen in the past are anything to go by. But yeah, man, just boning up that talent over on. Uh, on uh, here boning up again. Yeah. yeah, it's fine. I was thinking about it the other day. I anytime I think of it, I think of our first boning up interaction, right? Where I I let that go, and I, I didn't mean it like that. I just well, wanted, we had to have the first. He said, "You know, the talent we had our first boning. <laughs> we clipped this over. It's over right it's, now. It's, you know it's over for me, at least. <laughs> But when we had that first exchange, I was like. Dang, I can't really say that because it does sound kind of foul. And there's been so many opportunities. And I that was a limit test for me. I was like, let me see if this can get out. Let me see if I can get this out and if anyone remembers. And right away. Right away. Pushing that limit break. I see what you're doing. Yeah, well, I tried to fail. Audience got me here. So <laughs> nonetheless, just shoring up the defenses, we'll say, on yes. uh, the initiative totally for that. Probably a good sign for the project that in the middle of its development after showing their netting talent like Brian Horton. So um don't want to call it for either project yet, but looking forward to seeing more from both teams. Seems like yes. the next game we're going to get from Insomniac, since they've now confirmed no Spider-Man 2 DLC is going to be Venom. And um, yeah, no DLC for Spider-Man 2 is super disappointing because all those side quest lines are basically fucking cliffhangers. And that was like my... Mm. I, the more I think about that game, the more I think it's like super disappointing. I, I really, I love Spider-Man probably more than anybody, but just Christ, dude. Yeah. You know, the D, that DLC was like mandatory at that point. So we'll see if the Venom spinoff game yeah. concludes any of those stories but i think it's very clear that they they held all of that for like spider-man 3 yeah it's disappointing because yeah. you could tell a lot of potential they didn't remember the multiplayer game portion or whatever they had that, cool. that, that looked cool i was like man you know so yeah it's a shame it looks like they like I, I agree it looks like they're moving to part three and they're just moving on yeah for sure well we'll actually talk about games later on in the show that are not doing dlc either previously confirmed by yours truly but nonetheless we'll talk about it for now we get into jez Corden who reported that Xbox may be showing off some new hardware relatively soon. Quote, a little birdie has told me that you might see some genuinely new hardware next year, maybe of some form for Xbox. I don't think you're going to see hardware at the Game Awards 2024, but I do think next year is a good year for revealing new hardware, especially hardware you can hold in the palm of your hand. End quote. What could this be, Cog? What could it be? Could we be? Mm. On the, the precipice of a <laughs> Xbox handheld announcement, Jess Gordon. What are you implying, Jess Gordon? Think you slick? You know what's going on. So, um, yeah. I mean, you know that's what I want. Man. I, I really want a handheld from them so bad. Like, mm. you know, we've talked about it before. The problem. I think I had this conversation with Randall Thorne because he was just like, you know, I'm not a handheld guy. Cock, tell me, explain to me. You're a 
you know, Steam Deck slash Rock Alley. Why, why, why? And I'm like, look, you have to understand, as great as the Steam Deck is, you know what I'm saying, Proton and all that, and the interface, the UI is amazing. It is a PC-centric platform, right? And there are people who just don't want to do that from a console standpoint. I mm. said, what makes the Nintendo Switch amazing, it is a console-like portable experience. There's no back end. There's no windows you're dealing with, Rog Allen. There's no mouse, no messiness. You turn on, if they have something that mimics the Xbox dashboard, Mm -hmm. That looks just like that and has the seamless integration of the Steam Valve OS. It's a W. All you have to do is give back end access to high advanced features so you can get your ROG ally on. But that's not the front facing thing. Yeah. Right. You do that. And then remember, Xbox centric Game Pass, not PC Game Pass. Now, there's nothing wrong with PC Game Pass, but you want to mimic the console experience. And then the next thing is obviously the performance. And if you can makes even series s like performance or just love like rock alley bro and you get that price point mm -hmm. that's exciting and you're first you gotta be because you know sony's coming out with that <laughs> you gotta be out there so yeah we've talked about it if they get announced that's that's a huge deal for me i, I would be really excited i i know you're a handheld guy so yeah how would you feel if it if it does happen like they they announce like next year yeah, I mean, I'd be over the moon because, dude, like I, I was having this issue earlier where like I, I am lucky I have it on Steam, but uh, Z Metaphor Refantasia we'll talk about a little bit later and what I'm playing. Um, it's been I, I have it on PC, so I don't want to play this long JRPG in like this chair here. Like I want to kick up, get cozy. That's what I did for every other Atlas game, and I've been really struggling with it. And so I put it on my Steam Deck and it's I've been like going through it a lot quicker now because it's just I'm playing in more of my comfort zone. I'm getting distracted less because I'm not constantly adjusting my seat or whatever, or just moving my microphone out of the way. Just I'm in work mode too much, right? Like it's easy for me to look at this other screen right here and just go like, yep. oh, a DM. Let me just yep. play. and that's it, bro. It's done. And like I have a good attention span. So for me, when I'm doing that, I'm like, okay, I gotta remove the temptation, right? I'm human at the end of the day. Um but, you know, I do think about if Xbox had like a handheld in my dream world that supports things like Steam that's, you know, allows me to just have my all in one library. Right. Like just get from any platform. It's just this handheld that also is like a, I think of it a little bit like the Logitech G Cloud, right, where it is for like I could stream PlayStation games on it, but it was marketed for Xbox and it does have the Xbox app, the cloud gaming app. Like it's all right there for you to experience Xbox first and foremost, but you can get other things there. Like You can do Steam Link. Um, and stream from your PC to your to your Logitech G Cloud. And I love that about it. So I'm hoping for something that is on that level. If it's not, though, I mean, for me, it's just I notice that I get through these games a little bit quicker sometimes when I'm away from my work environment because I get pinged all the time. There's usually something going on with my game or something with a video or I come up with something. I just my brain doesn't stop until I get out of this room, basically. And so for me, handheld has been a huge part of that. I don't have the money to like get extra systems and like load them up on the on the projector in the other room and just be like, OK, this is my gaming room where I'm just like disconnected from everything. So all in all, very excited about this, dude. I love handhelds. I I don't use my ROG Ally really anymore. I am like a Steam Deck OLED guy strictly, but, you know, love the analog pocket. Logitech G Cloud still gets a ton of reps. PS Portal gets actually a little bit more reps than Ooh. I expected because I love the screen. And yeah. even though it looks awful, uh, you know, just like the system itself uh, for the PS5, uh, whoever's designing these form factors just needs to find a new profession because they're not doing a great job. Uh, I'm not going to say they need to get fired, but you know, they, you know, <laughs> be someone might want to like, hey, this looks awful. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, it, it do kind of look like they stuck two joysticks together. One end well, yeah, bro. Like, bro it, on the screen, like, and yeah. at the end of the day, people be like, well, that's what the Switch did, but the Switch is like a nice round shape right like it's a beautiful shape when it's all connected together it works right and playstation just like as cog described it you just stick these two controllers to the side of a screen you got this white plaque across the back that just kind of holds it all together and that's it still objectively speaking great screen comfortable to hold and that's why it's getting reps for me you know i use my playstation a decent amount and it's got it's got good wi-fi capability so when i'm across my house no streaming interruptions. It's nice. it's a great device. So uh, I love handhelds. If Xbox can give me something I can natively play my games on, I will be gaming on Xbox a lot more. I will say that that you know the the support that I've had for like Steam, mm -hmm. PlayStation has kind of led to me just doing a couple more pickups over there as yeah. of late. But if Xbox can get a handheld, I will I will be all over that. So. Yeah. 
I'm Let's glad stop. you said that because shout out to my man, Florida kid. Like I, when I got the Ally X, man, what am I doing with my old Ally? He was like, hey, I heard you had it, whatever, whatever. So I was like, hey, we negotiated a price and everything, shipped it out to him. He's like, bro, I'm going to be real with you. Just that handheld alone. He's like, I really not in the Xbox ecosystem, but because Game, Game Pass Native was on it, he's like, I'm playing Xbox games more. That's yeah. how you get new users. Isn't that the game? Yeah. Xbox, new users. You're all about the users now. You want to get people who would normally not be on your ecosystem. Hmm. The thing I worry a little bit about is it seems like 2025 is going to be the year you get a Switch 2. How do we feel about the conflict there? It's like, okay, okay I got you. Standing toe to toe with like the handheld king. I imagine gotcha. Switch 2 will still be handheld. Yes. So how do you feel about Xbox if they go, I mean, either before or after, maybe it doesn't make a difference, but a lot of people, myself included, were hoping for a 2024 announcement with the 2025 release to sort of like give themselves the room to gain momentum with it. But there is a world, a possibility, a strong possibility that Nintendo goes in like the first quarter of the year and Xbox announces their handheld like summer next year. No, valid point. We know who the juggernaut is. Yeah. We, 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 we ain't trying to play with the punching up crew. We know when they come <laughs> outside what it is. I have got tremendous respect. And I love the Nintendo Switch's device. I just felt it's time to upgrade because of how. Did you see cool. they confirmed back combat? Yes. Yeah, bro. I mean, I, I was surprised. I was, I was really surprised. surprised. I was like, worried. I was like, you know how Nintendo do sometimes with dude, decision this, this generation for Switch has had a lot of great exclusives, but a lot of it's also been defined on a business level is they resold you a bunch of Wii U games. The top selling game on Switch is a Wii U port. It's Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Mario and then they also discovered the magic that is, oh, you like GameCube games too? Here's Mario 3D All-Stars. Here's Metroid Prime Remastered. And I mean, by the way, Metroid Prime Reset, Remastered, brilliant. Don't get it twisted. Like they they put effort into that thing. It looks amazing. It's for many people borderline on a visuals a, a remake. But you know they they have like clearly benefited from. Oh, you can't access this. You have yes. to buy it again. Oh, here's Nintendo Switch Online. By the yes. way, you can't have Virtual Console anymore. So I, when I saw that, I was like, okay. I mean, I guess at the end of the day, it's kind of what Xbox said, right? Like you built up your digital library. You want to bring that forward, and not if you're Nintendo, you don't want them spending their money mm -hmm. elsewhere. But uh, damn, dude, I, I was surprised when I saw it. I was like, I thought they would 100% just cut their losses and do something new again. Yeah. No, I, I was surprised by that, too. I mean, so it was huge news to, to hear that they do it back with Compact. But to your question, you know, look, Nintendo's going to drop. Mm. I think the plan will probably be you announce. And then, even though I want it next year, they're going to have a market. So and to be honest, there's a part of me that also wants the better tech. Yeah. So I, I, I like it a little. You want to give me a little bit more than the wrong I like now? Hey, <laughs> I, I'm for it. I'm very curious on spec. That's where uh, I want to Yeah, know. that was going to be my next question. Spec, price. Yes. I mean. Because you can't yeah. get too crazy because it's like, you know, how, how much we, we know. We know that performance wise, you want to make a comparable device. You cannot go less to the Series S, right? Because you have to be comparable, comparable for developers to be able to port on a device with seamless. So if you give, if let's say you were able to get in that in between S and X, so a little bit more, bro, you know, you, you solve the memory issue that the S doesn't have and you have that there and now parts are cheaper and you got your little RDNA 3, your little resolution tricks, so you upscale it for a 720 screen or whatever. It could get interesting. Maybe you could hit that sweet spot of a five or a four because the price is going to be great. Because to me, if they come out as powerful as it is and they're talking seven, eight hundred. Yeah, as stuff. great as it is, as great as the Steam Deck and the Rock Alley, you're not going to sell to the masses. And I think that's the issue the PS5 Pro may be having. That's an enthusiast machine at that point. Mm -hmm. Now you're in this 10% of the population buys that. You want to get more. So I think you've got to be in that five to four range or less to kind of like really if you match the Series S specs. You should Ooh. keep it low, like 300. Mm -hmm. Bro, a lot of people were really excited about, say, MetaQuest 3S because they were like 300 bucks for it. And people were like, oh my God, like VR. I mean, we'll talk about Meta in a little bit. We'll talk about it. Yep. Staggeringly bad their 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 quarterly earnings are, but they're putting out affordable tech, man. And, and VR's toughest thing was breaking through that kind of price market. So they're doing a good thing over there. Um, and I feel like if Xbox can kind of create something very competitive, I mean, you got to remember, right? Long term, PlayStation's coming. Maybe they even arrive sooner with an announcement than Xbox. That's the other yeah. thing I always say. It's to me, it's over if they go first. I agree. You know, I they agree. the You're Xbox. Right. Wait until 2025. I'll admit, I was like, 
I saw it, I went, hmm, I don't know. I will, hopefully it's early 2025 because if your competitors really? go before you, both of them, and then you yeah. show up, it's going to be Xbox following the Yeah, yeah, the yeah March. that's going to yeah. be the perception. You're yeah. right. No, you're right. It, it's key for them to announce first. Yeah. So we'll see. Hopefully they know what people are doing yeah. <laughs> now that they got partners and they're able to, to, to jump out first. So we'll see. For sure. Next up in the news here, Cog. Zenless Zone Zero is expected to be heading to Xbox as a proven leaker by the name of Flying Flame has claimed that it's set for a December 2024 launch. And this month, I believe, uh, you're going to get Genshin Impact on Xbox. So the Hoyoverse is coming over to Xbox. Uh, this is a, a big deal to see it. I, I think it was just a few months of exclusivity over on PlayStation now with Zenless Zone Zero. So to get that quick jump over, uh, it's it's much faster than what we got with something like Genshin. Genshin was like four years. So just a, f- a four months, like... I'll take that W. It's not an actual big W. Yeah, Xbox, we want that day and date. But look, just having that moment there where it's like, okay, it's not four years. Exactly. Good job. Keeping it within the calendar year. We'll take it. <laughs> there we go. Improving the issues. And yeah, like you, you, you said it best. I don't really have too much to add in the sense that one year, four years versus four months. That That's what you know people want to see on the yeah. platform. The biggest game is not missing them to that extent. Yeah. So yeah, good job. Hoyverse is, is, is saved. Yeah. <laughs> good, keep it going. Yeah, they make good games. You know, they're not yeah. always for me. Like Genshin, I went back to and I kind of enjoyed. Um, but it's just such like a time sink that it's like tough to just commit to. But uh, it's good that Xbox will be getting this one soon, hopefully. This one I'm very excited to talk to you about, Cog. Rod Ferguson shared some interesting thoughts on what his plan for Gears was before his departure, where he's now at Activision Blizzard, saying he had originally wanted Gears away from Sarah and to discover the rest of the universe's solar system. More importantly, there was not a decision made on what happens, we won't spoil what, at the end of Gears 5. We have a write-in here from Tom, the Chosen One. Buongiorno, Dukes. Hope you're all having a great day. Recently, Rod Ferguson, formerly of the Coalition and director behind Gears 5, stated the original plan for Gear 6 was to depart from Sarah and explore the rest of the local solar system. While I'm not well-versed in what manner they would explore the rest of the solar system, it seems like a wild idea. He also said they haven't made a decision on who lives at the end of Gears, si- Gears 5. So, with the wild-ass idea of exploring other planets out there, what do you boys think? Novel idea or jumping the shark? Personally, the take I have is that between this idea and the fact that they were going to pick or go back to E-Day makes me think that they wrote themselves into a pickle and don't really know how to get any satisfaction out of it. Thanks once more for all of the great stuff you boys have for us. And I hope you all have a, Maddie said no more, no more Bioware videos, but forgot his N7 this week kind of day. That's true. I didn't consider that when I, <laughs> I was trying to get away, bro. I was trying to, you can see that last video. I was like, I'm just trying to end my week, bro. I was like, <laughs> I was like I'm just trying to wrap up my week and put a, put a fucking bow on this thing and move on. <laughs> Can't escape it. No, yes, I guess not. I was out. We will see what N7 Day brings uh, tomorrow as we record this, yes, actually. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, they said it was going to be a quiet N7 Day this okay. year. So I, I, which I think makes sense. Like, do not, like, they're doing everything they can to not damn Mass Effect before it's even shown itself fully. Uh, but, Cog, we have yeah. debated the ending of Mass Effect 5 so often. And now we get the guy Gear who five, put Gear that five. ending mm-hmm. into effect. And what he was kind of thinking of doing, and even he's like, well, I had a plan on what we we're going to do, like gameplay wise, but choice wise, I don't really know. And I'm very surprised he put this answer out there because then you see the game that is announced after his departure is away from all of this. And then if you remember, there was the Windows Central Gaming interview with the coalition that mentioned they did not shut down the idea that this will become a new trilogy, E Day, right? Mm. And so you look at all of this, and I, I, I think. You have to acknowledge like they don't want to answer that question at the end of five at all. I mean, five, I, I thought five was really good for the most yeah. part. You know, it tapers off a bit at the end. I think the third act wasn't really that good, but the first two were fucking amazing. Yeah, we're, good. we're amazing, amazing. And, uh, you know, it really was just that ending that sits with you, though. Most where you go, OK, you got to pick one. And I, I don't know. I feel like one choice is more obvious than the other personally, but. Um, still, I, I, I'm, I'm very curious if they'll ever make that decision. So, Cog, what do you make of what Rod had to share with us and what Tom the Chosen One wrote in about? Shout out to Tom the Chosen One, Realm of Dukes, and yeah, Rod Ferguson, the finisher, man. Look, I was shocked at how transparent and open he was talking about this. Yeah. Like, he was going in. So, he seemed taken back that the direction was actually, you know, the E-Day stuff mm-hmm. after he's gone and stuff. But, um... <sighs> It, it, all right. First of all, about the going to other places, 
I wouldn't mind it. I wouldn't mind it. I, I think there is a part of me that feels that you got to shake up the Gears formula on some level, right? And I think they've obviously they've done what they felt all they could do initially with the Marcus character. And then obviously, um, you know, now pushing it and they had JD and then mm-hmm. why am I Kate, right? Um, homegirl's name is Kate. And then Kate and stuff like that. So now it's like, all right, where do you go next? Then you, I agree with Tommy Jones, but you did kind of write yourself into a corner. You did kind of say, hey, cliffhanger. So now we become what's canon. And these are the issues that Cliffy B had. He was just like, why you didn't just have the balls to do it? You know what I'm saying? Yep. We, we, we did it when we had certain beloved characters. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It had to go. So that's the thing. Now, Rod, in his defense, he's like, yo, I did have a kind of a plan and it was going to be. But he did say there was like an internal debate as far as that discussion of how that was going to go. So, look, me personally, again, I'm going to say it again. I am selfish. I do not care if anyone <laughs> live or die. Who cares? That's selfish cock talking. E day. I am glad they did that because to me, you got to go back to the essence and get this the glory days. <laughs> it, is a, it is a weird moment of like Xbox really avoiding stepping on a rake, right? Like the stepping on a rake when you think about it, just buy on paper is like, let's go and try to answer this cliffhanger. And get further away from what many people think Gears is, right? Mm -hmm. Because for me, it was all about tone, really. Like, I thought, especially in Act 2, Gears 5 had, like, one of the best lore-based reveals of the series. Like, but it was also because it was tonally in the right place. Like, I think one thing Gears really got away from was being true co-op. Like, I think that the original trilogy did some really great things with level design and just when you split up how you rely on each other a little bit, like different levels of the stadium. So even, cool. Right. It goes such a long way. And I hope that's what E-Day gets back to. Cause yes. I think that's, what's really missing. Yes. We got that. And bro, where's the dark, the horror, the fear, yeah. like it's too much Michael Bay sometimes in the later yeah. gears. Like we're just blowing stuff up and raw big set pieces. And I want that. Oh my God. It, the, the, I got to tell me all the time, the berserker moments where it's like, yo, you cannot kill. You got to go outside. You got to get the hammer, you know, or the, the krill moments, those dark moments where it's like, you got to go from light source to light source. You can instantly die. This, the fear of this stuff. I, I, I just like that tone. So going back to the essence in a pre emergence day with beloved Marcus and beloved Dom, I think it's the way to go. And you kind of milk that situation yeah. <laughs> as much as you can. That, that's just me. So again, I don't care if they ever decide to go back and not to, yeah. you know, who. That's, that's just me. Like the pressure with Gear 6 is it has to be the end. It has to be, right? Like you have to tie a bow yeah. on everything. And I don't know if E-Day is going to somehow loop and just set everything back up into mm. five to six. I mm. doubt it. Uh, I'm just I'm assuming that they're just going to leave it right. That's I just feel like after all of this time spent, they were doing yeah. like tech support for so many oh, teams. Yeah. They were doing that Matrix Unreal demo. They do all this crap. They finally get to pick their direction and they go way back. I just think by nature of the sequence of events, it's very telling what they think of Gears 5. Yeah. You know, you lose the guy who had the vision for it. So yeah. whatever you do is not going to probably be fully in line with it. Even yeah. if you bring him in for consulting. You're just right. not in his head with what that video yeah, was with the start of four. I just, it was a recipe for failure, quite possibly. So yeah. Rod uh, is is completely Blizzard and Diablo now. Like he's in a whole different space. So yeah, yeah, I, I, I I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pull of, I gotta pull a bias, Maddie. Like like <laughs> it, it, it's, bias, it's, I, I gotta put a hyperbolic bias, Maddie. Like how you get with dishonored and it like. Yeah. Bro, that's where I'm at with my gears. Like, I hey. don't want to hear none of that new gear stuff. Give me what got me here. That, Look, that's what I fell in love with this franchise. All this other stuff is cute. You want to do open world. You want to flirt. And then you want to do these soft choices where you don't really commit. Nah, man, sure. we good. Get us back to the old, or the old gang and the old crew. Look, dude. Look, I'm glad you brought that up. It's my turn now. Next little item here on the news. In an interview with PC Gamer, Arcane Studios founder Rafael Colantonio shared some thoughts on Xbox's closure of its Austin studio. Quote, I think if you look a little bit, it's obvious that Arcane Austin was a very special group of people that have made some cool things and that could pull it off again. I think it was the decision that just came down to we need to cut something. Was it to please investors, the stock market? They're playing a different game. The rules that they play, we might not understand them. It's a different thing. It's hard to know why they did what they did. The only thing that I stand by is saying that the specific choice of killing Arcane Austin, that was not a good decision. 
when you have that magic of Harvey Smith and Ricardo Bear, et cetera, that all come together, it's a specific moment in time and space that just worked out this way, that took forever to reach. These people together can really make magic. It's not like, doesn't matter, we'll just rehire. No, try it. That's what big people, that's what big groups do all the time. They try to just hire massively and overpay people to create those magic groups. It doesn't work like this. So to me, that was stupid. But what do I know? End quote. So a little bit of advocating for the more organic approach. You, you, you hold on to these two talents and hire around them. But getting rid of the studio as a whole, you lose those two. And this is actually something that our good friend Colin has said a lot about, yes, about that yes. retention to Xbox. So what do you make of Rafael mm-hmm. Colantonio's thoughts here? I always love his ability to speak his mind. This dude always speaks his truth, never hesitates to do so. And I'm very pumped for Wolf Eye's next game because it's looking like he's like, he said a little obsidian, a little dishonor. I was like, bro, saying all the magic words right now. Come on. You can't do that to me. I'm getting all hot and bothered out here. But man, I'm pumped for his next game. Cog, what do you make of his comments on Arcane Austin Studio? There's a lot of truth. There's a lot of truth. I mean, look, in today's climate, when you have a flop of the nature of a Redfall or whatever, right, that's what happens to a studio. I get it, right? I'm not stupid with the economics here. However, I do agree with him in the fact that that level of talent, you know, you have the great Harvey, you know, Smith, and it's like Ricardo, like, it's a shame because we know that situation from what we learned they weren't even really confident in that game to begin with. And, you know, they were hoping the studio would shut that particular game down and Microsoft step in. And I think it's a lesson learned from Microsoft with coming too late into the party on, on an acquisition, right? And not having their fingers on the pulse of what's going on. And sometimes I have to admit, as a person who was pro acquisition, you know, that's the detriment when you don't have, you're so big, sometimes you, you're not able to infiltrate and get down to the core issues until it's too late. And in this case, I felt it was a little too late. So I personally think Harvey Smith and Ricardo are just too talented to be let go. Mm. I understand the economics of it, but I, I would hope that they, Arcade also would have been one of the ones that were able to save, you know what I'm saying? But we get it, you know, it, it's unfortunate, man. I, I really, I agree. I agree. Like you, you, in my opinion, you figure out a way to keep that going. But again, I don't cut the checks <laughs> and I don't know how much yeah. they lost. And we I know we think. have to say Redfall was, yeah. was flat. A hundred percent. Yeah. I just yeah. think letting those to especially harvey i don't know too much about ricardo but i've heard great things but harvey is like a legend bro like you just yeah that's like oh we just fired hideo kojima or we just fired uh any name any todd howard like to me it's like he's on that level i know he maybe isn't as reputable to some people but like he is behind some of the key immersive sims that have defined that genre and just to be like yeah we're we're willing to lose you like i don't know man like some people are worth building a full team around that's what guides this industry again those names i just let out that rod ferguson another one like this guy what do we call him called the finisher the finisher yeah. yeah oh bro i know it's like i've got mutual friends of his and me and him are cool but i don't know him like that but the mutuals oh bro you want to talk about co-signing someone without them being there mm. they like cliffy b bent the knee he was like oh now he's like bro if it wasn't for rod ferguson I don't know where I would be as far as just the he has this inept ability when it's you know how game development is hard. And sometimes it's those make or break moments from one year to year where it's not coming together. Yeah. Not only does he has that, then the deadline portion of getting something across the finish line and mm-hmm. shipping a complete polished product, it's hard, man. This guy, multiple people rave about him. So yeah, the fit, I got tremendous respect for Rob yeah. Ferguson. He, he, he's a beast out here. So for me, with, with Harvey, you know, I, again, so fortunate to really sit down with him and get a chance to pick his brain, you know, during the Red Force situation. And you still, I did learn a lot. Now that I watched that interview back just recently, he was throwing out, he was throwing out subliminals to me that I didn't catch. Mm. He, he was just kind of like, um, you know, making a studio and then the COVID and, and the climate and, uh, and, and bro, like he was, I, was, I didn't oh, even catch it. Like, morning I was like, shots, he, flares going in the sky. <laughs> He's doing that. Help. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're so proud of just being able to get this out kind of energy. He, <laughs> he didn't, he didn't directly say it. Yeah. If you watch him, it's one of my highest before videos, you know, say, cause one it's Redfall and he doesn't come outside often. Obviously yeah. it's Redfall, the controversy people want to know. And then the funny part, the inside joke is, where they kill me in the ILP community, 
is they had me interview me in the tightest couch between two men you have ever seen. So the jokes in the comments with me, they's like, why is these two men on this tight <laughs> And you know how big I am. Yeah, so it looked yeah. funny. You know what I'm saying? So I go from, but the dude, yo, he's such a pro. Like yeah. I, I learned again, he, he he's very, very clever and discerning the way he talks. Everything has meaning. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, you, you guys you know. are happy it got out, but you know the conditions this was. Yeah, he knew. He knew, bro. So rip Arcane Austin, man. I wish there was a better turnout. Unfortunately, a lot of this, the talent that made those teams is gone, but that's not the argument Raphael's making. He's just making it on behalf of two really ridiculously talented people that yeah. were a big part of what made those games great. So, Rumor is, again, no, allegedly, Harvey may be doing yeah. something. So I'm here in the streets of Rumler, so hopefully Good. He, we, we don't lose and we get some new stuff. Good. Let's hope so. We get some updates on Bioware. First one here, Bioware has confirmed a Rolling Stone that they are not making Dragon Age the Veilguard DLC and have centered their focus on Mass Effect 5. Uh, I'd hate to be that guy, toot my own horn, but this, this I saw it making the rounds. I was like, damn, really? <laughs> uh, this was in my interview when my preview went live. This I sat down with the game's director and asked her directly, like, will there be DLC? She's like, no, we're like, just focused on getting this out. And we're just, mm. we're not doing DLC. Um, like, we're not doing a trespass or anything like that. And to my understanding with that interview, it's because Bioware kind of recognized the mistake that Trespasser low key was because the true ending of that game was baked into an expansion that was like a year removed from the actual release of the game. And when you do that again, honestly, it's one of the positives I can bring up about Veilguard is they there is a sense of finality. They're done like it. Mm. You could end Dragon Age there and and walk away from it. And I, I think part of that is the plan to kind of mass affect it a little bit like, all right. Yeah see you in like a decade maybe i don't spend a decade since the last one but <laughs> point being is i think they're gonna leave it for a while and let people uh enjoy what's there and for others hopefully forget about it but um yeah i, I, I was a little disappointed i won't lie to see see the news making the rounds so i was like man that that preview i can't even act like that preview bomb that preview got it got around man so mm -hmm. uh was disappointed but nonetheless no dlc focusing on mass effect 5 um they also confirmed in, a, in this same interview uh, that the Mass Effect team did work on Dragon Age of Veilguard, which some people see as an indication of concern, but they were there particularly for polishing and finishing, gotcha. not creation. So, gotcha. you know, there's also that too. But uh, what do you make of this information, Cog? Um, surprising only from the simple fact that like their model generally always had that DLC kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. And part of me thinks, you know, playing it safe in a climate where, Development was rough. You know, they went through so many changes. Hey, let's just try to put a, a finished product out. Let's, you know, a complete product out as opposed to, you know, trying to milk this thing and compartmentalize it. You nailed it with the trespass at DLC and the fact that, you know, for those who never played it, you literally missed out on the real ending to Inquisition. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think I don't have any problem. It's just I don't have a problem. With, I was just surprised that they committed to saying no. But I I'm think it's a budget about, thing. Like, yeah, that I think part they're too. lucky they got the game out at all. I yes. think most teams would have been shut down with how their last three developments have gone. Mm -hmm. And you look at this one, it's like, look, just get the fucking thing out and just move yeah. on. Like, I, I don't think they have the capital to be doing. I'm, I'm sure, sure that was a talk. Like, when we commit to this reboot, we're not going to be able to support this thing for years. Like, it's going to be this and it. And yeah. I think it was a good call. Yeah. And again, as the biased Mass Effect guy, let's get focused. <laughs> Are you still? Uh, have we talked about this? Are you? Are you? I mean, you haven't played Veilguard yet, but are you? I still... have, but I don't. I haven't played enough to. Mm. I feel have the discussion because of a, of the where I'm at with metaphor. Mm. And apologies for the cops; they were upset. Yeah. But um, no, no, I have played it. I just feel like playing two hours is really not fair to have a discussion about. It. Yeah. You know what I'm so uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you were if you're still excited for Mass Effect. Um, oh, I mean, of it all. Let me revisit. When we get to my games playing, I'm gonna tell you where I'm at with Metaphor and what's going on there, and I'm very close. And um, mm. yo, oh yeah, bro, we we gonna talk. Okay. I, I, that, yeah, then we'll get into you know Dragon's Age and stuff like that. I have early stuff, but in fairness to the game, me playing and good past you know one or two stages ain't enough for me to say where I'm at and see sure. the meat of what people have of the issues okay. people have. So. Gotcha. We'll talk that. We'll talk. Bye. Where's John Epler? has spoken on remastering the older Dragon Age games, and it appears they are softening their stance a little bit. Quote, 
I think I'm one of about maybe 20 people left at Bioware who's actually used Eclipse. This is the former engine for those games. Uh, it's something that's never going to be as easy as Mass Effect, but we do love the original games. Never say never, I guess, is what it comes down to, end quote. Um, they have to do this. There's a number of fucking reasons. Number one, money. I, I say that because like, like, people forget, and even I sometimes forget in my coverage, that Mass Effect Legendary Edition did come out and sell, I think, millions. Like It, it, it did really well, and a lot of people were like, well, Bioware might go under, and I think the fact that Dragon Age of Elgard is doing seemingly well, not incredibly well, but like decent at least. And then the game before this, like they've had two potential successes in a row. So um, I think if you want to pretty much secure a third success, uh, go back and remaster these games. It's definitely a low lift project. I think Mass Effect Legendary Edition took them two years to do. And a lot of that work was spent on the first Mass Effect and kind of retooling it. Um, the challenge with Dragon Age seems to be that you have eclipse um with origins and two to my understanding I, I have to double check that real quick but then you have frostbite with dragon age inquisition so you have a halo master chief collection situation where you have multiple engines running within the same project not unheard of definitely doable and bioware has if anything they showed with the, the veil guard that they're technically sound that game was polished I didn't have really any bugs. The worst I had was sometimes a camera flicker, uh, which just was fixed by locking and unlocking it on a target. Otherwise, though, they showed that they've handled that well. Uh, Mass Effect Legendary Edition came out in a great state. Didn't have any issues with that on a technical level. So I feel like they can figure this out, and I think they need to, because I just feel, number one, what benefited the hype for Veilguard before that damning trailer and then the gameplay they subsequently showed afterwards was being reminded of like, damn, these games, they made some good ones, man. Like, and playing, I, I was there, man. I've covered Bioware for as long as I've covered Bethesda. Potentially, actually, if I look at the history of my channel longer. Um, and I saw in real time, like people get reminded of like, damn, they do. This team is special if they're clicking. And Mass Effect was one of those moments. And that faith restored and then hearing the good news about Veilguard, people were like, oh, my God, yes, like this is this is what we need from them. Like they, they, they are making it single player. Uh, they're getting away from live service like th this is great news. Like it's offline game. Um, so, yeah, I think it, I think if they want to restore a little bit of faith again before their next big release, I think this is an easy win for them. So I think they need to do it on that as well as look, dude. Mm -hmm. There are quality of life enhancements that all of these games could really use. Mass Effect kind of like it, it was a blessing that they touched up one in the way they did and left two and three. I'm like, perfect. That's exactly how I would have drawn it up to uh, with Dragon Age. It's a little bit worrying because Origins is the only non action game in the series. And it also happens to be the most loved and highest rated. And it could see the most changes because it's technically the oldest uh, especially if they change anything graphically, like that game captures the tone of what drag. I mean, it's the origins. <laughs> it, it is the tone and the atmosphere of a dragon age game. So I worry about changes they would make with that. I don't fully trust them with that. Uh, but dragon age inquisition, I, I worry that's the one that they kind of leave on the table and go like, all right, just bring it back. And, and like, let's not rebalance the power table, redo some of these side quests and like how they just play and how they're dispersed around the world, that sort of thing. Like the balancing of the game could be a lot better. So I just think there's a lot more opportunity to to right some wrongs with a Dragon Age Legendary Edition. And I hope they do it. There's just so many reasons why, as I've laid out here, financially, creatively, securing your future more. Uh, I think they need to figure it out. I, I really think they should. I hope they do. Um, I, I, even if there's only 20 people who know what Eclipse is on that team. <laughs> How much time that, is in the building? No more than, than most teams have. So get on it, Bioware. <laughs> Kyle, get any thoughts on this? I've rambled enough on it. No, I feel you. It's just, I, I just don't know if they have the bandwidth. I mean, That's he, fair. He's, out, you know, he's out here saying that. But to your point, I feel the opportunity was missed. Not that it was missed, but if you were going to do it, it would have been a nice ramp up before Veil Guard. But I think the next opportunity is, okay, if you do another one, right, especially if we assume Veil Guard continues to do okay, and then you're like, all right, we're going to announce the next, you know, well, uh, you know, addition to the series, it would be nice to get that nice remastered package 
reminded and kind of set it off kind of in a similar way that Mass Effect trilogy kind of came out and they style that intermediate period before Mass Effect 5. So that's what I would like them to do if they have it. Hopefully by then they can have some resources to do. Let's hope so. That's, well, man. that's a good point though. Yeah, they they the fact that they called in the Mass Effect team and they called in support from a bunch of other teams across the EA, they they may be shorthanded. Yeah. Um, they did do a lot of firing and restructuring ahead of Veilguard's launch, right? Like they got rid of Star Wars The Old Republic, made some layoffs, changed leadership, etc. And so um you know, that that probably leaves them a little shorthanded for multiple endeavors, clearly. Yeah. All right, Cog. Next up here, some updates in the world of Ubisoft. For starters, Star Wars Outlaws creative director Julian Garrity is being replaced by Drew Reckner, who is now making some big promises for content updates headed to the game following the poor sales it yearned in its debut. While they continue to update Star Wars Outlaws, Julian will be focusing attention his attention on the Division 3. Here's what Drew had to say in what is coming to Star Wars Outlaws. Quote, the first key area of improvement to the game is combat, where we see a real opportunity to add depth and excitement to the experience, further rewarding your tactics and precision. The second key area is stealth, which is not only about improving the readability and consistency of enemy detection, but also providing choice in how you want to approach each encounter. Finally, our third key area of focus is centered around the character controls which means improving the reliability of cover, increasing the responsiveness of climbing and crouching, and generally improving the consistency of controls overall. These changes all kick in with update 1.4, which is arriving on November 21st, the same day as the game will be arriving on Steam with its first story pack in Wildcard. The second thing here, and we'll talk about this together, Assassin's Creed Shadows will start a brand new modern day story in the hope to find a similar footing as they did with Desmond, from the original games ranging from Assassin's Creed 1 to 3. So, Cog, any thoughts on some of the creative decisions they're making here with Assassin's Creed or Star Wars Outlaws? Well, first of all, shout out to Division 3. I've been waiting to hear about this. Yeah, <laughs> so, a little you know, spy confirmation. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I hadn't heard time. about Division 3. It was just kind of an assumption, I guess. But Yeah, because didn't they were supposed to do that? Um, I wish I could talk to my man Slow Mo. He's such a Division guy. Um, what was it? The Heartland, Heartland, right? They yeah. Like yeah. Mobile. You're right game or something like free to play something like that yeah. right so it's just like okay we had that aspect and i'm like what's going on because co- contrary to part fire belief you know as a person who is a destiny guy i liked when the division initially came out to try to push destiny right yeah. and i love the idea of gear set so look shout out to them on that part at least i know that's coming we'll see what happens yeah. as far as star wars is concerned yes because i once i heard your review and Saul's review i'm like star wars i'm good when I heard about that stealth and I heard about just just you can't take the gun with you and the, the drops and it, it, it just immersion breaking to me. And I was just like, nah, I'm good. That's core cool gameplay mechanics. So kudos to them to recognizing the backlash, actually course correcting, actually taking the feedback, improving the game. Yeah, I'll see you in November when when it's out there and, and the 21st. And hopefully, you know, you've got a lot of those issues corrected. So I know it's harder to go back to a game that you put in so much resources and thought was going to be the bang of the year. You thought you, you had something and people told you, nah, fam, that ain't it. Yeah. So yeah, you know, I, I, I like the fact that they're going there. So I'll be there. As far as shadows, I don't know how I feel about this. Mm. I don't know how I feel. Cause there's a part of me like, well, maybe I'm the minority here. It's just, I, are you at, what is it, an animus guy when they go back and forth? I, I thought the way the the kind of games media was spinning this was really perplexing because they were like, this is a rare positive for the game. And I'm like, wait, it's like, didn't people complain about this all the time? Like, oh, man, I was just getting cooking with the story and I got pulled out of the animus. I was like that. I, I know it's anecdotal, but I was like, I feel like that was everyone's consensus. So they gradually slimmed it down. And then they got to Assassin's Creed 4, where one of the biggest talking points about that game was like, hey, guess what? You barely get taken out of the Animus. But also, they've restarted the modern story before. Like, they had a new modern story protagonist in uh, entries Origins through Valhalla. And they also tried the whole movie thing with Rogue and uh, Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Like, they've tried all of these different approaches to the modern day story, but they're acting like, after 12 long years, we're kicking it back <laughs> up and going back to the modern story, just like we did with Desmond. And I'm like, no, you're 
You're doing the same thing you've been doing the whole time. <laughs> I just feel like everyone who was writing these articles coincidentally just hasn't played Assassin's Creed recently. That was my only read of it. Yeah, I, again, I, I was just like, all right, bro. Like, <laughs> like you think this is going to work? Uh, God bless. I'm trying to be open-minded, but I am not yeah. pumped for the animus. Anything that's pulling me out of feudal Japan is not going to be something I'm going to be excited about. So yeah. I never really liked it. I, I mean, I never really liked the animus. No, I, so I, it was... I, I agree. The thing is, is they're going, they're doing what Ubisoft always does. They go back to the past ideas they really liked and not evolving them. It's like, yeah, this worked for Desmond. What was exciting for the people? There are a ton of people who do like the anime story. What was exciting about it is like the idea that this Templar assassin war is ongoing to the modern day. And by researching your history and getting all the memory sequences and getting those secret endings, like there was there was kind of gold beyond the hill. Right. And and that was the fun chase for a lot of people, like that story. But once they made the right decision and ended Desmond's story with Assassin's mm-hmm. Creed 3, like it was time to do something new. And I do think at the time, the right choice was what they did with Black Flag. Like, get this out of the way, hit the reset button. It's not important anymore. And Black Flag was fantastic. So I think they did the right thing, but now they're going back to it like it's sort of this you always like this <laughs> now <laughs> bringing it back of like you've you've tried this you tried to seriously bring it back with like origins and odyssey and it didn't work so what's the difference i don't know i'll keep it open mind because look yeah, man this game got stealth gameplay very tom clancy inspired i'm like hey man i've been waiting for that since like ac unity so sure bring it here like i'm down for that but this did not light my fire. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I'm in the same boat as you. So I'm glad I'm not alone. Wait, wait and see. Wait and see. But yeah. for now, I'm like, eh, whatever. Yeah, same. Uh, as for Star Wars Outlaws, I, I mean, remember when we had that long talk when I reviewed the game? Like, uh, this was a game that was so frustrating to me because it was the thinnest margin between. I don't do number scores, but I always said it was like the thinnest margin between like a five and an eight I've ever seen. Like there were so many little choices for me that just amounted to just being a, like a downtrodden experience that could have been so great. Now, I don't want to put the cart before the horse, but what they are saying they are targeting here feels like tailor-made for me based on what I had an issue with. Because when I remember going into, and look, I talked my talk, I'm going to take my L, going into the launch of Star Wars Outlaws, I was like, this is going to be great because Ubisoft knows how to make a good open world. I want to live in the world of Star Wars, check off my lists, and just have fun, simple gameplay. And the story will be whatever, but that's okay. It was the reverse. The story actually wasn't that bad. It was kind of good in some ways, but I couldn't get fully into it because the gameplay was so bad and backwards from what Ubisoft has typically delivered. Like, hey, we're going to give you just a pistol. You can pick up all these weapons, but you have to drop them if you interact with anything. Uh, You have no ranged options available to you, like long range options. I mean, like a sniper. Uh, Hey, you have this stun shot on your blaster pistol that will alert anyone nearby you, but it'll take out one opponent. You can use this like once every three minutes. Like these sorts of decisions just added up for me. They, they, They added up. There were less avenues on how you wanted to approach environments like i wanted to love this game so much but they made it so difficult with some really bad decisions so what does this mean for me i will be re-downloading and checking out this update because it does seem to target they said hey we want to give you options in combat cool that was that was problem number one problem two the stealth right just choking everyone out in a star wars game that's what i'm doing i'm fucking choking everyone out and i get like one stun shot so I hope they have a really good answer here. I'm really pulling for them, man, because like I mentioned, there was a thin margin between that five and that eight, if you will. <laughs> like it, it was a very eh game, but it could have been great with a few key yeah. decisions that were made differently. And for them to get on it this quick, I'm hoping that they have a good answer here. And timing it out with the Steam release and everything, maybe they get something going. We'll see. Yeah, but we'll see. look, man, it, it's it's opened my mind to be like, all right, I'll re-download this the day it comes out. Give it a second chance. See what's going on there. Because I did want to... I had it on PlayStation. I was like, oh, I, maybe I'll get a platinum trophy or something. That'd be kind of fun. Uh, but once I was done with that story, I was like, nope, I'm out. Done. Mm, Couldn't yeah. take it anymore. And what did it for me, too, is what you discussed about the faction relationships. And I hope... I forgot about that, yeah. That gets addressed at some point also. Yeah. No mention yeah. of that yet, but... Yeah. This is called Dev Update 1. They did yeah. mention, like, watching YouTube videos and clips and Reddit and Twitter. And they said, like, we're trying to take it all constructively. And I mean... Based on my review, I feel like they they took something away from what myself and others were saying. So yeah. good step in the right direction. Was. 
All right, Cog. Monster Hunter Wilds is going to be one of 2025's biggest games if it's open beta numbers or anything to go by. On just Steam alone, the beta amount amassed over 463,000 players, becoming the fourth most played game on Steam at the time. Nutty. Nutty. Just a beta, man. So, did you try this out by chance? No. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think of the numbers? Guy. <laughs> but the numbers are impressive. You know, I'm not a boss of the guy. Salute to the boss of the community. You guys show out. You guys love this game. I see the clips. Beyond, look, big monster hunters here. Yes. I understand the juggernaut that it is. Oh, yeah. And I, I, I remove your release date mm. when, they, when they come marching in on <laughs> February. Mm. People are making the right decision. This is massive. Yeah, it is tremendous community. I think I was watching, shout out to Jazz. I think he was playing it on the Xbox 2. They had it on their uh, screen. And I was just trying to take, out, take a look at it. And classic monster. I'm like, yeah, this is going to do yeah. well. I can yeah. totally see it. But yeah, salute to that community. They they really seem impressed. I got to talk to Ebotis. He's a huge Monster Hunter. Guy. Oh, really? I know he. Oh, bro, that's his game. Oh, he, I didn't know that. He one. was just excited. I even tried it. When he was like, "How did you feel, guy? Wait, wait, what you thought?" <laughs> I was, I, he slid in the deal quick. I was like, "Dip, bro. All right, I get it. I understand it. There is a fun. I I, I get the loop." He's like, yeah, they even try to give me a bad strategy. I'm like, calm down. <laughs> uh, Don't get carried away. Convert me. I can see. I was like, no, E. I know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say it, and I, I gave it a shot. Right on. Well, it's looking great. I didn't get a chance to check out the beta. I am looking forward to it at its release, though. So we'll check it out then. All right. One year from the game's launch, Remedy has confirmed that they've recouped most of the development and marketing costs for Alan Wake 2. It is still marked as the company's fastest selling game so far, hitting 1.3 million sales by March of 2024. And Perna Interactive will fund 50% of Control 2's development, which is set to begin in 2025. And for the quarter, Remedy is up 128.6% year over year to or uh, to a, a cost of $19.4 million. So uh, Remedy is an interesting one, man. Like I can't take my eyes off of them and, and what's going on with their financial situation because I feel like, and I could be wrong, I'm not trying to fear monger. I want the best for them, but I feel like they're hanging on by a thread in a lot of ways. They're taking a lot of deals. Like they took one with Annapurna took one with Epic, took one with uh, Tencent. Like, I don't think you just do that if you're like thriving, man. I think especially if you are a year removed from your quote, fastest selling game, and you're just now about to finish recouping the development and marketing costs, like you haven't even profited on your investment yet. I mean, great, kudos to them. Alan Wake 2, you're how many years removed from the, the original game? Impressive that you, you, you got this far with that. But I just feel as much as I want them to remain independent, I'm keeping an eye on the moves they're making because they're, 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 I think, a key one to watch. I've talked about it extensively, so I don't need to go too long mm -hmm. about it, but with FBC and kind of their investment in mobile a little bit, they're trying yeah, yeah. to find ways to make more money beyond their AAA games because I think there's a level of acceptance setting in of like, okay, we make damn good games. No one's buying them right now. Like no, like 1.3 million sales for a game of the year contender last year. It's a little soft, and I think they deserve more. Don't get it twisted, but uh, they're important to watch because they are looking at different ways to make money. And they took the blood money that is Tencent. They also took Annapurna money. They took money all over the place. So they have a lot of deals in place that are going to help maintain their independence. But for how long? They need a major success. That's what they need. They need a really big one that's going to drive them a ton of money. So I'm pulling for them. I hope that's the case. Oh, they also took the Game Pass bag, right? Yeah, they took the bag. You know, yeah, with, yeah. with the Firebreak one. So, mm -hmm. yeah, they're, they're an interesting one to watch. Kyle, what do you make of these numbers here and, and where Remedy sits currently? Man, I mean, kind of kind of sad in the sense that, man, it took, it took so long, right? I, mm -hmm. Look, I'm glad that they recouped, right? That That's huge. You don't want to take a loss, yeah. right? But it just feels like it just took such a while. And it's a shame because everybody raves about this game like this is one of those games and i just look at them historically with sam lake and like the the i'm going back to the quarter break days as well it's just they make these quality games but it's just they're so expensive and i just feel like in this climate for whatever reason they're just not selling the millions and millions of dollars that you know that they've put in and to your point yeah they've kind of been on some mercenary like hey let's take a bag from whoever is offered to you know support the studio so it's a shame because they do make high quality games and um you know we'll see you know as far as the financial stuff i do worry about them 
I just, I, 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 there's still a part, I'm not fear mongering, but there's a part of me that's just like, man, you know, if, if the next one don't hit, you know, it, it, they're one, yeah, they're, one out of here away, yeah. I, that energy. And I hate to feel that way, but it's nothing immediate because of the deals they've yeah. secured. But yeah, you feel like they're one game away from their whole studio's fate changing. Yeah. You know, it's not like they have a bunch of money and maybe they do. I could be maybe totally wrong, but it's not like yeah, they have a bunch of, I would assume, cash in the bank. Otherwise, why would you take these deals? That's the, that's how I'm feeling. I feel like it's almost, you know. We're in ex energy. Yeah, survivability, check yeah. the check energy. Like, that's <laughs> right. Remember, I used to say that with Square. People laughed at me. And I'm like, now we see, they, they, they screaming for the rules. Yeah, everything's going to be from this point on multi platform. Yes, yeah, Xbox, we'll, we'll, we'll jump to this one real quick. Square Enix is it. looking for more global simultaneous launches on all platforms, according to Yoshi P. When speaking with 4Gamer and translated by Eurogamer, quote, in the future, Square Enix titles will be released simultaneously on each platform more and more. But since this is close to the first release, we would like Xbox users to play it as well, end quote. So, yeah, this is like, just continue. But, yeah, to your point. No, thank, thanks for the tie-in. Yeah, that's literally what I'm talking about. Again, you know, when you when you take a lot of these mercenary deals and, and stuff like that, it's good in the short term, right? Mm-hmm. But in, it seems like in today's climate, because it's really beneficial to be out multi-plat from the jump, you know, you've got to do that earlier now. And that's why they're not eliminating Xbox. They're not eliminating yeah. PC kind of thing. So we'll see what happens with, with Remedy. I'm a, you know, I'm a huge fan. I got a chance to finally meet him. Awesome guy. And look, the talent, the quality of the games speak for themselves. They're just expensive to make. Yeah. And I, I do worry about them sometimes. Yeah. I feel like there's many routes to secure a bag in this industry. And I think that's what kind of makes it beautiful from a business front. Like for indies, sometimes you might just need a good game pass bag. Like if your project's low, like you might just need the game pass bag and that might push you into a state of like, Hey, we made all of our development costs back. And if you negotiate a really good deal, you might've just already made money on your game. And so anything afterwards is like raw profit and you kind of go from there. Obviously you want more profit, but that could be short-term thinking, but it gets you past the finish line in a way where your investment is paid off. So there's ones like that. I think you just can't afford to miss PC nowadays. That's the realization all these developers have have come to an understanding of. Like, you just can't skip PC. Unless you're yeah. Nintendo, I guess. But you just, you can't skip PC. You can't. Yeah. And the I best agree. case scenario is you're a power world, right? Like, you are a viral exclusive game. That, by the way, is still on PC. But you're yes. a viral exclusive game. And then you get all these sales. You continue to update your game. And then you come to the next platform in PlayStation. And make more money by selling probably millions more afterwards. So... That I think that's the key, right? Like you need to be everywhere as quickly as you can. Uh, maybe like timed exclusivity is in the end of the road, but you have to be on PC. That is just seeming to be the make or break. You have to be on PC. Yeah, I agree. All right. We have some information on Lego Horizon Adventures. I'm looking forward to this one. Uh, Tom Henderson has first reported that Lego Horizon Adventures will be a relatively short game at six-ish hours with around the Platinum Trophy taking 15 hours, which I know for many people was like, this is such PlayStation coded energy on the Xbox show. But I thought that this was just an interesting talking point on game length and what you make of something like this. I, I, cause I've been playing a lot of Lego games this past year or so. Remember I've been on that kick. I yeah, do Lego Batman Renaissance. two this year, Lego yeah. Marvel superheroes this year. Like I just quietly have them rolling on the side. They're fun. They're cute. I love them. Um, this is way on the shorter side though. And especially completionist side of things way, way shorter. I feel I feel like a, a Lego game when it comes to 100% completion, which typically is what a platinum trophy should indicate. I could be wrong, um, but usually it's like 30. So half of that kind of crazy to me. But what do you make of, of this game length here, Cog? I mean, I defer to you because, you know, you play these the Lego joints and you, mean you don't do creepy Cog at the park with the Legos. Legos are for everyone, man. Come on. <laughs> You try to have me sit Indian style with a tank top with the Legos on. Like, come on, man. I'm too big for that. <laughs> no, no judgment free zone for the family members, family friendly members of LSF. You know what I'm saying? Just not about the. I will say, I admit, I'm a fraud, though, because I did when it was soon as it was Marvel. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, Civil Surfer? Okay, I'm in. <laughs> so, fraud alert on me. Well, no, it's not fraud alert, bro. They spoke to your sensibility. They spoke that's to awesome. my sensibility. There we that's go. That's how we're going to say it. That's, how we, that's what we're doing? Okay, yeah. I, I like that. They spoke to my sensibility. PR speak. <laughs> <laughs> I like that PR. You cleaned it up. That was good. So, uh, yeah, look, man. Six hours, you know, for, for a historic fra- you know, franchise that generally are longer, you know? I guess the, I guess the way I look at it is um, I'm more curious about the, the Gorilla PlayStation nintendo switch energy of this yeah 
I, that to me, the whole place, this is a conversation I have with Colin, the whole PlayStation LLC verbiage is very interesting mm-hmm. to me. Mm-hmm. Like this is new territory. We are targeting this franchise as one of our pillars. We also open and put it everywhere else except Xbox, <laughs> <laughs> which is funny, which yeah. is you got it. That's bad funny. So oh, it is. Yeah, it's like, it, it's, to me, it's always places like, that's cool that y'all do a kumbaya. <laughs> we still don't like you. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it screams to me, yeah. and I think it's fun. But we don't like you, but we need this bag. Mm-hmm. Hey, Nintendo, we haven't talked in a while. How are you doing? I mean, it's, it's interesting it's, energy. It's brilliant, bro. You got a younger audience over there on Switch for sure, and you put the, sure. the next Lego game there, and uh, I mean... It's smart. Like, it's good business. Yeah. I mean, not that they'd sell less copies by putting on Xbox, but they're probably like, we can eat that. Optically right. win. Have our kid can eat it, too. You yes. know? And how, how further does that Nintendo relationship extend, especially mm. in a world where Switch 2 is coming? And if you want to flirt with more PlayStation IP elsewhere. Mm. Very interesting to me. Yeah. Next up, Cog. Variety has reported that a sequel to Hogleg aka Hogwarts Legacy, last time I'll be saying that, is in production with a storyline coordinated with the upcoming HBO series, which is going to be based on the books. So, man, this is the most obvious news ever. I mean, what, 20 plus million copies sold in a year, outsold Call of Duty. This is probably the reason WB Games is still in business, dude. <laughs> like, Facts. That's, that's the only reason why. Uh, so, yeah, no doubt they're going to go all in on this, and I'm sure they're going to do more beyond just Hog Leg, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. Any thoughts, any excitement for this? I want to give Hogwarts Legacy a second chance at some point. Didn't really, me too. Didn't really click with me. Uh, but once I heard that DLC is dropping next year, I was like, all right, I'll, I'll check it out then. Yeah, get a little, little some performance enhancements, whether it be yeah. a PS5 Pro or whatever. And the fact that, again, like, I want to see the new content, see what they do. Like, this is a no-brainer. I am still blown away that that game, single player, destroyed the entire year like yeah. like completely obliterated when you beat call of duty bro, when's a game done that like can we really i can't i can't think of one but it's not even a multiplayer game yeah that's the crazy like it is mass i'm with you wb bro you better go back to the well you better have your rollout yeah. for this 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 whole franchise because there is demand. It's international appeal. Because one thing I realized, you know, in Europe, oh my God, it is huge, huge, man. The part of it, it was a perfect storm for them. International appeal. There was that pushback on people trying to silence the game. I think that propelled this thing to a whole new level. There is no doubt that some of those copies sold were people buying the game multiple times. I saw a lot of people online going like, "Thanks, I just bought another copy of it." Like. There was a lot of fuck you purchases with this game too, yes. bro. And I'm sure that added up. I don't know if it added up in the millions, but the thousands for sure. Um, and every bit counts <laughs> when you're yep. when you're WB right now, right? You have Suicide Squad flopping. Uh, who knows what's going on with Wonder Woman? I hope it's doing well, but like we have we don't know what Monolith's up to. Like those are some of their big teams, so they need Hogwarts Legacy to do well. So Absolutely. you know, Harry Potter is about to take another big step into the market with with an hbo series i mean oh you know it's yeah, on it's gonna Will be we trying transmedia tie-in oh, oh it's dude. on yeah it's gonna be crazy so yeah. i hog leg two could actually surpass the first one if they could time be. it right they, they, they time they, it right game. game's good yep. now you got the series that would be like a game of thrones game coming out at the same time like what mm-hmm. <laughs> huge it, it, it's a w waiting to happen if they nail it right great next up here cog kingdom come deliverance uh, Warhorse Studios has shared that the title has sold over 8 million units. Congrats to them. Really great numbers to see here. Uh, game absolutely deserves it. It was a little buggy at launch, but it shows that, I mean, granted, this is where years were like, wow, when did this come out? 2017, 18? Uh, I think it was 17. So 17. Yeah, seven years, I, I mean, debut. this game's been on sale a lot, but still, it seemed like it was a success out the gate. Um but kudos to them, man. They deserve the success. And I, after everything I've gone through, right? Like just all these RPG developers letting me down. I have averted my gaze a bit, Cog. And I am looking at Warhorse Studios with Kingdom Come Deliverance 2. My heart beating a little faster whenever I see that game. I am, I mean, I covered the first one a lot. So I caught up late on the second one. When I was watching the gameplay, I was like, damn, dude, this is like, get me this game ASAP. This looks really good. So I'm very excited for it. What do you make of 8 million copies sold for Kingdom Come Deliverance 1? My baby. It's like, I'm, I'm a proud dad. You know what I'm saying? Again, 
ILP's infancy, you know, early ages and, and seeing that game, in, you know, at a PAX and just like, well, what is this? Yeah. And covering it early and still one of our highest performing videos. And, you know, they, they just, I remember it was like, I was, I was like, yo, this is like realistic Skyrim. I was mm-hmm. like, like super hyper realistic. You know what I'm saying? With the, and, and, and just the character development and man, it was so good. And they stuck to their guns and, yeah, I, I am super proud. I remember the whole, you know, try, them trying to get the game off the ground, you know, kind of thing. So mm-hmm. now we're ready for part two. You know, I believe it's uh, CryEngine again. And yeah, it looks great. It looks great. The combat, everything. Man. Combat. I'm, I'm, shout out to Henry and the, the, what is it? The famous, I'm quite hungry. <laughs> 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 you know, so shout out to him and hands. Oh, man, it's going to be fun. I cannot wait. Yeah, I was uh, really excited by the new crime system. Like you can get like branded if you break the law and people won't do business with you or kind of look at you funny. They showed in the gameplay, bro. You have to like fish someone out of a pile of crap and take their bow from them. And when you walk by, they're like, Oh, but I just like, what's that smell? Bro, you can stink, you can get drunk, you can sleep. Like, this game is wild, yeah. bro. Yeah. Yes. I just love how the world reacts to you. It, it's, yes. it's something I love about Rockstar games, honestly. Like, I'm not the biggest Rockstar fan uh, because I just am the weirdo who loves Bully exclusively. But I love fucking with things in Rockstar games and just, like, seeing how the world reacts. Like, when you bump into people enough times, they're like, all right, that's enough. Like, you've hit me one too many times. I'm like, oh, damn, they had a line just for that. And then... You cause too much ruckus and 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 the the sheriff in the town will come over in a Red Dead 2 and he'll be like, you got to go. If you don't go in 10, I'm opening fire. Like these little stories that kind of break down. It's just the systems in those games are amazing. And I feel like Kingdom Come really uh, reflects a lot of that, which makes sense. Daniel Vava is like the uh, the creative director, I think the director. I don't remember exactly. And uh, he was behind like the Mafia games. And, and those are all centered on realism and like reactive mechanics where it's like, don't speed. <laughs> don't run a red light. You know, the cops will come after you, like those sorts of things that bring you into the world a little bit more. So uh, it's just got his fingerprints on it. Very excited about the game. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Cog, this one I'm very interested to get your thoughts on. Meta's staggering earnings are in from gamesindustry.biz. I got the article up here. Let's read and then discuss. Meta published its third quarter earnings today and has recorded a loss of $4.4 billion in its AR VR Reality Labs division. This is the third reported loss of the year in this segment with Reality Labs reporting a loss of $3.8 billion during its first quarter and $4.5 billion in the second. For its Reality Labs business, Meta has said that Q3 revenue was up 29% to $270 million, which was driven by hardware sales, which I think is when they announced the the 3S. Reality Labs expenses were also up 19% year on year to $4.7 billion, which Meta said was driven primarily by higher headcount related expenses and infrastructure costs. Meta noted that it's re- expected Reality Labs 2024 operating losses to increase meaningfully year over year due to ongoing product development efforts and investments to further scale its technologies. Meta said it has reached several milestones around Reality Labs in the integration of AI and wearables this quarter, such as Ray-Ban Meta glasses, but said little about its latest mixed reality headset quest 3s beyond mark zuckerberg noting that the new hardware brings the best capabilities of quest 3 when questioned about the ongoing losses for reality labs business cfo susan lee said i'd say reality labs is clearly one of our strategic long-term priorities and we expect it will be an area of significant investment as we build out towards the very ambitious product roadmap we have there end quote so staggering losses but they don't seem to be wavering is what i'm very surprised to see like this would crater multiple times over the bill it's not millions billions of dollars lost (laughs) it lost so much money dude and they're like yeah this is a long-term investment and i think the proof is in the pudding a little bit like they are the leaders in vr but but like no no question comfort battery life feature set games exclusives they got it all in spades, dude. It's it's. I was a VR doubter, and then I got my Quest Three, and I was like, "Damn, dude, we've come a long way." Like, I oh, used man. the Oculus Rift S, and do I oh, had God. like a, a wire coming out the, the back wire, of my the, head? Oh, what is my computer? This thing weighed a, like a brick on my face. I'm like, yeah, this is this is cool and all, but like, I can only get get down with this for like an hour. But dude, you can grind in that headset. Bro. Like, it is, it is a different beast. So color pass through. You have a history of meta. Obviously, you yeah. speak as much as you'd like, but what do you make mm-hmm. of these losses, dude? It's like 
insane that they're kind of seemingly firm on continuing to head in this direction because they see something there that they're like, this is going to pay off. Yeah, look, man, shout out to, you know, the matter of a former stomping grounds and obviously, you know, my my tenure there during the uh, Quest 2, Quest Pro and stuff like that. Look, one thing I will say, like, again, let's be, let's elephant the room. These are really big losses, right? We're not going to minimize it. This is huge. And to your point, you know, other organizations would not most likely be able to survive these type of losses. Now, one thing I could talk about during my tenure there is Zuckerberg's commitment. Like, it is insane. Like, he truly believes in this project. Now, here's what I could speak on. When I was there, I felt Quest 2 was the perfect storm because you had this amazing device, like you said, lightweight, wireless, untethered, right? Great quality. Oh, and, and no it, Facebook shit. No, exactly. And then one of my proudest moments, you know, being as part of them, because I know they, they leaned on me for a gamification aspect. And I'm like, look, you know, no one wants to be their government name. They want to be Lord Cognito. They want to be Mr. Matty Plays. This Facebook requirement that you guys have is actually costing you guys. Because I remember speaking to guys like you and speaking, guys like, yo, is that Facebook thing going yet? Because until it's gone, I'm not. It's what made me drop the Oculus and everything. Yeah, dude. I forgot about that almost. Yeah, bro. It was a huge deal. That's one of the one of the projects I'm very proud as far as the Horizon, making Horizon accounts, which were decoupled from Facebook, that all you had to do was have an email address. You didn't have to be anything because no one want to see your grandmom and your mom while you're doing whatever you're doing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that's the first thing. But now we get back on point. You know, this is where I, from the outside now looking in as a person that was once at Meta, I feel some of the pivots were mistakes were the the Quest 2 Pro in the sense that you've now outpriced yourself. You made this like $1,500 quote unquote business style device. And to me, your audience was that sweet spot of the $250, $299, get in and have a good product. Now, Quest 3, amazing. I love Quest 3. But we still have to remember, it's still a $500 price point. As great as the tech is that deserves that price, I look at the 3S as them getting back to where you need to be. Bucks, bro. Huge. In the price range, that's why you were successful, in my opinion. That's how it was an easy sell for me to go up to people and say, all right, you never have a try VR? $299, check this out. Mm-hmm. People are like, oh my God, I've been having this is amazing. So that's where I'm, I'm hoping the focus is there. One thing I will give them credit is the focus to first party studios. Oh, it yeah. is tremendous. And I I challenge anyone. Asgard's Wrath 2 as a packet is one of the greatest killer apps in VR history. That game is a full-on RPG in VR. That I'm talking about no punches pulled. You could do true VR gameplay as if you were in a Skyrim. It is amazing. Yeah. So, you know, it's a shame because I do want them to rebound. I, I hope that this is not too little too late with the course correction of the 3S. And I do worry sometimes long-term with all this investment because at some point, if you keep bleeding, stakeholders going to have to talk with you. Yeah. And be like, fam. <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm saying? But I'm, I'm pulling for my, old, my, my colleague. I got t- tons of friends and colleagues over there. And I will say, as a person that initially wasn't the biggest VR supporter at all, I was like, oh, I don't know. I, I remember playing using the Quest for the first time and blown away. You see, I still got my Demio. Yeah. That was one of the games that really took it to the next level for me. I'm like, yeah. oh my God, this game that. is special. So yeah, that's what I'll say. And then um, I did like the la- a couple of things that they did, obviously, with the uh, Game Pass integration and you know certain other aspects of stuff. But they got a long way to go. They got to get that casual, man. To me, it's that casual market, that $299. You got to stay in that pocket. You really can't go over that. because Otherwise, you're in this enthusiast territory. Yeah. You're not going to sell a lot of units. I feel like they got to be close. To, they, they're clearly, as they are slimming this down and making it lighter, they have to be close to that, like, throw on a pair of glasses moment that yeah. everyone dreams of with VR, like yeah. the scouter from Dragon Ball, like that mm-hmm. moment of just boom, it's there. It's not this big block on your face. Like they have to be getting close. That has to be yeah. the end goal, right? The investment yeah. is like, it's a hundred bucks, flip open your glasses, throw it on. You've got everything right there. Yeah. If anybody can do it, it's them as far as the tech. The yeah. key is, can they survive the long game with the financial aspect? That's going to be the yeah, key. For it's them. like what? 10 plus billion dollars in combined losses for a year. That's insane. Mark is a passionate dude, I guess. Zuck, Zuck believe he believe. If there's one thing he's more passionate about than the UFC, it seems to be VR. You always see this dude. I feel like anytime I fire up a fight card, this dude is in the audience, like getting fired up. Uh, I always remember uh, 
oh, fuck, I think it was Marab was fighting. Who is he fighting? The guy who he like picked up and carried across the octagon and dropped him and was like yeah, pointing yeah. at at Mark. Fuck, I forget his name off the top of my head, but I distinctly remember that moment. I was and Mark was getting all fired up, right? Oh, he's big into yeah, it. He's big into Huge. it. Yeah, yeah. He fights it all. And I think he would try to fight Elon before yeah. they would try to fight for real. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, remember they tried to get it in. I think Elon backed out. I heard Elon don't want to smoke. Yeah. Look, he's busy. I, I he trains MMA. People think he's like you look at him, bro, it will go down on you. Don't yeah. leave him alone. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I remember that. The, um, mm-hmm. And that, and then I think Lex Friedman also yes. trains. Like, yes. yeah, there's just, yes. there's like low key, like ninjas in this yeah. space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like, yep, I remember that. All right. Next up here, Cog, we've got a few more items on the news. Take two, their earnings report has stated that private division has been sold off to, at least as of this moment of recording, an unidentified purchaser. Obviously, we could theorize who that it is, but, uh, this is better than the team getting shut down, right? This is, uh, I always think of the outer worlds, you know? So this is, this is a win in my book. Um, but any thoughts, any guesses? I don't really have much to add on this subject personally. It's just surprising, you know, private division, like you said, I, I think they, they, they have an eye for talent. You know, obviously outer worlds came from them, right? You know, mm-hmm. before Microsoft came in, the first outer worlds, we had our interview with the uh, writing, the narrative directors for outer worlds from private, I was dealing with private division. And then no rest for the wicked. Mm. That's a, big one right yeah. and their future securing that so yeah you know they, they're going there hopefully they, they have a home and they're able to continue because i do feel they have a great eye for talent so hopefully they you know the buyer comes forward and the, these guys are okay because I, I want them to they said well they definitely sold it and it's an unknown but i'm curious who the unknown buyer is and hopefully business as usual because they deserve to continue i love their talent hades came from them bro yeah Division. killer all right, Kai. Next up here, Sega has confirmed that a new Virtua Fighter is in development. The full quote is, so we have a suite of titles in development right now that fall into that legacy bucket, which we announced last year at the Game Awards, Crazy Taxi, Jet Set Radio, Streets of Rage, Shinobi, and we have another Virtua Fighter being developed. And so that's all very exciting. And then in certain instances, we're also doing animation series or live action films to augment that and be part of these roadmaps. Uh, this came from Sega's new global head of transmedia, Justin Scarponi. So uh, what do you think of this, Sir Sega? What do you think of a Virtual Fighter game being in development? I think it's good to see. I just, you know, there's not as many, like there's Tekken, but like there used to be Dead or Alive coming around often. Virtual Fighter would come around. Like there's a little more 3D fighting. Soul Calibur, we Ooh. already saw a Harana mm-hmm. go in on that and what happened between Tekken yeah. and soul caliber so we kind of have more clarity on that and it'll be a while before we see anything soul caliber related but i think this is great news to see man it's cool to see sega kind of lighten this one back up too so thoughts on a new virtual fighter sir hype hype this is a renaissance for me so i think um first of all, shout out to Carrick. we were able to talk about I, he's a huge virtual fighter guy mm. and i remember when i talked to you, he's like, you you're a tech but i'm virtual fighter that mm. was the kind people don't realize virtual fighter was the king Tekken was some young upstart that yeah. people laughed at at Tekken one and te- like in Tekken two they started taking them a little serious but virtual fighters that am2 team they push graphical fidelity to the highest level and literally were the the leaders until Tekken three came that's when the, the tide turned but I would love to see it. Unique competition in space. Sega, shout out to my man, Robert Keller, who put me on to this um, information. It's cool to see the Sega researchers to the classic IPs that got them there. Mm. This is amazing. I'm getting my Shinobi. I'm getting, look, I'm in a good place. I'm in a good place. And I hope they do well with it. Now, Virtual Fighters is a unique system. Obviously, you know, block button and stuff like that. But it's, it's a hardcore fighter. And I would love to see what it looks like in this day and age. I know PlayStation had an exclusive version, maybe in PS4, I forgot which one, maybe Virtual Fighter 5, whatever. But um, yeah, I, I would like to see a proper entry, multi-platform, and, and see what it could do. That, that would be really cool. Mm. Yeah, I, I am just excited for more fighters on the market. The more, the better. I just feel like mm-hmm. the space goes through these waves where there's all of a sudden a ton of games coming out, and then there's none. So the more, the better. Excited to see Sega get involved in that again. All right, Cog. Time for some fun stuff. What games we are playing this week, sir? We have some interesting lists and some that we unify in, it appears. Yeah, so I actually want to do this different because we are playing two of the same games again mm-hmm. <laughs> in a different way. But um, what I want to do, because obviously my two are, are Metaphor and Black Ops, I am 
very close to the end. Oh, I think I'm at the end. I am pretty actually got confirmation from Attica. I'm at the end. Okay. How many hours did I take you, by the way? I've just been feeling everyone out because I'm hearing so many different ranges. My play style is different because Mm -hmm. I don't want to say I'm a completionist, but I have what's that? Um, I'm doing everything in this game. So your your hour count will probably be more indicative of mine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I have that, that that's what's that term when you just can't leave stuff alone and you have to like stay talking to you. Like I got to go talk to that one. Yeah. I I complete everything, bro. Yeah. And and what it is the same thing with followers and, and building the relationships with, with all my characters. So yeah. And and now I'm really getting to the depths of archetype system. So I want to, before I talk about what I want to talk about, I need to know where you are. Okay. Because I, in respect of not spoiling anything for you, and I'm going to speak in code for certain things. But yeah. um, to first, let's start with you. Sure. And, and where you're at, your experience, sure. and then I'll tell you where I'm at. Okay. Yeah. So for me, with metaphor, I am nearing the 20 hour mark. I I will speak in code as well for the audience because yes. I know it's a yes. long game, so I have respect and make sure yes. we don't ruin anything for them. I am at a part where I, I have my gauntlet runner, which we all know nice. is in the game. I have my gauntlet runner. I'm in the, a new place and I'm getting my next mission and I'm building up to that. And I have the opportunity to explore, set up a couple of relationships before operation two is a go. So that's where I found myself. And dude, I just uh, am so impressed by the design of the game. Like this had to be so difficult to make where, you can go all over this kingdom basically. And like, there are certain things uh, in social elements that progress in certain areas and like certain ones that you can pick up with particular characters in specific towns. And they'll lead you to these dungeons. And I love how creative the dungeons are. Cause they're getting me to explore the archetype system a lot, dude. Like there was one I went to where I had to take out the merchant class because all of these chests were fakes. But when they saw me with my money out there doing gold attacks, they were like, wait, and they missed a turn. And I didn't realize that at first because I forgot to read the uh, the uh, our, our friend, the insider, his info. The insider. Right? Yeah. And so I, I I was like, oh, wait, no, I remember this. I switched over and I realized like the turns were skipping and it was it was such a difference in the difficulty of the fight because I was getting whooped. Otherwise, I was like this dude's got a ton of health, ton of Man. turns, just foul, dude. So Ooh. I love how they're kind of basing the dungeons around the classes that you get to play as. Um, I thought that was really cool. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not really in the weeds of it. I'm starting to unlock like tier two archetypes. Like I got a magic knight now, which is mm, kind of like a mixture of warrior class. and knight. Yeah, Who you got to imagine that you keep it Hulkenberg with that. Uh, right now, Hulkenberg is a knight, and I, I'm okay. afraid to take her off of that to get the magic up because I'm like, dude, she's so she's like the one person on the team. Because dude, I'm a glass cannon, I'm a mage, and I love straw. I love my man, but like he's but doing better right now. Right? But I but put him on the brawler class. But oh, you got it with the hands, yeah. okay. He's doing better now, but yeah. the, he's still, I always get a little nervous when my man's in combat because it's just, I feel like he's always set up to get knocked out. He's always first man down. So if I lose the Hulkenberg tank, even temporarily, this game is going to be a severe, severe difficulty spike for me. So I got a timeout where I probably, like when I switch her over to, I think the mage, that is what you need to level up. I will probably make my character a knight because I have a mage that's almost maxed out. Nice. So I'll probably swap those two. So at least I have mm. someone still tanking. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm I'm not in the thick of archetypes yet, like getting multiple skill inheritance slots. And, I was about to ask you that. You know, yeah. So I still have like one for some of these, but I, I have like two for warrior, but I'm not using warrior right now. Um, but I'm just, I'm really impressed by the scale of the game, how well designed it is, and also how balanced it is in, combat difficulty but but even things like the economy like just i have to be very picky with when i buy my items like what armor am i buying am i because it's so easy to frivolously spend in this game because they usually have like two tiers like this is the stuff that's going to let you hit really hard above your level and that might make some dungeons easier but not everyone can have these quite yet so you have to pick those and same thing with armor it's like this will give you a lot of evasion like right now, I think Stroll has like 20 evasion based on the equipment I have on him. I'm like, yeah, try to hit my man now. Try to knock him out now when a quarter of your attacks are going to be whiffing on him. Almost nice. a quarter. So mm-hmm. yeah, the build crafting's getting there. Uh, I'm not head over heels with the story yet. I, I'm not there yet. I got to be real with myself. Like I love the characters, but when it comes to the story and the impact I'm looking for, 
it's a thoughtful commentary on, in a lot of ways, election season. It's a thoughtful commentary on people in power and the things they'll do to reach that power. And I'm taking it as such, and I think I won't have a complete nuanced take on that until the credits roll, because I just know there's so many layers I have yet to experience, and I'm kind of surface level at the scheme of things. But the characters are doing it for me. I enjoy hanging out with them. Hulkenberg's really winning me over. She's just oh. awesome. I love hanging out with her because, dude, I'll say, look, I got to say this one thing. It's a, I'd say like a, a minor spoiler, 5% spoiler. Rank one of her social. Bro, you as the character, they're racist to you. I'm like, straight up. I'm like, damn, dude, what the fuck is this? Uh, Filthy elder. Yeah, they're like, oh, you're with that. I'm like, <laughs> damn, bro. <laughs> fucking unbelievable so i uh yeah man like i but i love that they're going for these tough themes because that was a moment where like you just feel that gear in your brain turn you're like damn okay wait they're going there okay let me see what you got here like all right and they handle it so responsibly and do it so well without like in that moment i was like is hulkenberg gonna come and like coddle me now like what's the what's the reaction and it's like you kind of talk it through with it just felt human it was Mm -hmm. it felt like really it just felt real so yeah, I'm I'm already getting there. Uh, I'm just not all the way there. And and to be fair, I I wasn't all the way there. Twenty hours into Persona Five, four. Uh, I'm loving the music, but I'm still developing like a ear for it. I guess. Sure. Um, it's great, but it's not like I'm tapping my like. Anytime I'm playing an Atlas game, I'm like, what's gonna get me kind of like, like jammed yeah, and tapping yeah, my yeah, foot? I, I think it's when like I'm on the Gauntlet Rider and I get ambushed. That track, that kind of mini yes. boss track. I'm like, yeah, like I get the goosebumps. I'm like, all right, let's go, let's fight. Uh, but otherwise, like I'm waiting for that track where um, I just stand and listen. It's kind of happened in Academia. I love that track. I think it's a yes. hero's vow. Mm-hmm. But I, I haven't gotten that moment otherwise. And I'm. Not it's not bad. It's just not right. having that like persona. Like, persona. That's Bob. that's gonna be in the background of yeah. every video for like three, four, five years now. It's gonna be in the background while I'm working. You know, I have to take some time to find that track, but mm-hmm. it, it is an excellent game thus far. I'm really nice. enjoying it. So yeah, 20 hour mark. If you could keep me in the dark, that'd be yes, great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best yeah. to, to, to really look. But 20 hour bar, I remember where I was at. And um, yeah, I just started blazing and I got I I, I first started like you. I was like, look, I like this, this is cool. Mm. Then there was a moment I'm like, oh, okay, we're mm. heating up now. Mm. Now let me just say this. The part where I was at before where I'm at now, all I'm going to say, there is a, without spoiling, there is a build up to a mission that the stakes are very high. Mm. And it is one of the dopest stakes and plans, so to speak. Mm. That sequence, I remember speaking to Attic, I was like, yo, I'm here. He's like, where you? Cause he's like, where you at? Where you at? I'm like, yo, I'm here. He's like, oh, you right there. You about, it's about to go down. I was like, shut up. Don't tell me nothing. Mm-hmm. Let me judge for myself. I got to a moment and I'm going to tell y'all right now. All I'm going to say is opera. That's all I'm going to say. Hmm? All I'm going to say is opera. That's all I'm going to say. Mm-hmm. And bro, I thought I knew what metaphor was doing. Mm-hmm. I never left a scene where I was like, what just happened here? What? Mm. It was so, this scene was so amazing. This is the game of the year for the scene alone. I was like, <laughs> hey, yo. <laughs> you know when you know, I'm like, this is going to happen. This is where you set me up with that character. Game was like, oh, you oh, re- really, Cog? You mm. think that's what, let me show you how we do story. It was so well written. It was tear-jerking moments. Okay. That excites me. What's going to happen? And that ain't even nothing to where I'm at now. Mm. So I'm like, hey, look, this game did something at the part where I'm at now, where I, just, where I was just like, okay, you have blown my mind. You have done something I've really never seen done with the protagonist, per se. And now I, I want to see how you land this plane because I am thoroughly invested. Now, do I have my nitpicks here and there? Yes. There was like one or two things after some amazing moments where I'm like, all right. Y'all kind of gamified this little, little thing right here, mm-hmm. but I'm going to let you slip because everything else was amazing. You know what I'm saying? So, but, man, what a ride this has been. Mm-hmm. And, and all I will say is there are, keep, uh, advice to you is keep leveling up 
all your archetypes. Do not sit on something that you have mastered. Switch you that. You match it over. out and then move you on. Switch over because you yeah. want to continue to get experience for these archetypes because they're going to keep showing you more things and more mm-hmm. other prerequisites for more. And the relationships, this relationship story stuff, the side quest stuff is, is dope. Mm-hmm. I'm in a grind mode right now. Mm-hmm. I First of all, I'm super powerful. I will give myself credit because there was a boss <laughs> that I got to that was so frustrating. And I'm like, F this game. This is BS. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like, I was so bad because prior to that, I had challenges. But there was just one thing where you get to a character and it was like, oh, you think you're the noble hero here? If you can't even get past me, what makes you think you're going to save the world or do anything? Mm. And when I got to this entity slash character, mm. I was so humbled, bro. I was just like, how am I supposed to be? This thing is doing things in turn based. And I'm like, this is unfair. This is beer. And I had to sit there and I had to figure this out. And I was like, okay. Are you hitting that restart the battle? Oh, restart it. So that was the first time I'm like, yo, all right, let me go back. First let me change. Time, uh, props to you. I've used that so much when I like just get mixed right off the bat. Oh, no, no, no. I, I've re- I, I would say an average tough fight, most remixes two, two to three. Oh, okay. I thought normal. you meant that was your first time hitting it. I was no, like, no, no, damn, no. Lord turn base for sure. About, <laughs> <laughs> I ain't that nice. I'm talking about when you get to a point and it's like, yo, this is BS. There's no way I could beat this. Mm-hmm. I don't understand what I'm supposed Start to do. To tap, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, yo, this when this thing does this, and then it goes multiple times, and then it's like, what, what am I supposed to do with this? So I had to sit there and think, okay, calm down. And it, it, it's the level, again, this is why this is the future of turn base. Like, mm-hmm. the levels of intricacy, the levels of strategy, the level of combina- combination also don't sleep on synthesis strategies who archetypes that work better with other archetypes oh. and a lot exclusive synergies that you're like oh okay and then you're gonna i learned the all i'm gonna pro tip i'll just give you one pro tip without a spoiler when you when you get anything that says does almighty damage yeah oh yeah <laughs> anything that says almighty oh, is what? truly almighty yeah saved me in a situation uh-huh. that i thought was damn near impossible so i will give one pro tip there okay so like I, i'm at right now the game was like, okay this is the final thing and um you've got about 30 days to build to this mm. and it is on the climate is is crazy the, man the twist the turns the this is a little game of thrones but i will say this i two tear jerkers nice. two legit tear jerkers in this game so I, I'm, I'm blown away i I spoke to some people that was like, yeah, they did it, but I need to judge it for myself. But up until this point, it is still holding firm for my game of the year and the future of turn base. And there's nothing. And it's telling such an amazing story. And they did something so unique that I haven't seen done in a video game with the character that I'm like, how do you land this play? You're almost you're almost flawless here. Mm -hmm. So. Let's see. Let's see. So I'm going to grind that. I could have did it. I was like, I need some sleep. <laughs> this game, Because this game is so addictive. I, I just yeah. didn't want to stop. And I'm like, all right, I know I'm towards it, but I want to grind correctly. I want to get certain classes. And I got something right now that is so sick. But mm-hmm. I don't want to spoil because you got so much to explore. I, I'm talking in code. I apologize. I want to talk. But, you know, I don't want to spoil for no, the audience. <laughs> I don't. I definitely can't spoil for you. Because I, I want you to tell me when you get to certain moments. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. I, I will keep in touch. Yeah, because I've, yeah. I've been putting the hours in finally. And I'm, yeah. I'm hoping to have it done by the end of this month. Because yeah, and when you're ready, cool. and if Brad and someone whoever, I think I think Brad throughout the SOS, you know, you know, maybe for a spoiler, yeah. I'm ready <laughs> when you guys are ready. So that's it. And then I was just going to ask you, curious, because again, now we're playing both uh, Black Ops Six. I finally I was playing more multiplayer to be honest this mm-hmm. this week. So I didn't really get. I, I got to get the story done, but man, it was so so crazy. But I'm curious now. Did you? Because I want to flip it back to you. Like, did you get a chance to do any campaign? I haven't done yet? the campaign yet. No, I because okay. I, 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 okay. I, you'll see my third game kind of pulled me away. Okay, but let's go. I did, I did play uh, the other zombies map, and I just want to provide update thoughts. Yes, right? yes, please. I was, please. I was having issues with with Liberty Falls, and a lot of the audience was like, "Yeah, I get where you're coming from," but like zombies is a little bit different nowadays. Like people kind of, I was getting boomered a little bit. Like, yeah, like they weren't disrespecting me. They were just like, "Yeah, okay, Grandpa. Like, we get it, man. Like that was kind of it. Like, yeah." Like, very nice about it, for sure. I thought I was going to get dogged on for that take. But I went to the other map. Uh, I forget the name of this map, so I apologize. But there are two maps in Zombies. One's Liberty Falls, the one that I was kind of like, this was everything was immediately available. It was kind of boring. And this other one is more traditional zombies. Like, you start off in a small area. 
you gradually knock these doors down, you get your juggernaut, and at the end of this all is like a pack a punch, and you find the best routes, and there's secrets, and you can like swim on this map too. Um, it was exciting. It was much better. My problem is though, whoever, I mean, from the multiplayer to zombies, whoever made these maps, like playing, we had three people on our team. And there's a part where it's where like the, there's an elevator that can go up and down and can go down to an area where there's like a boat and it's like a big circle with water. And that area, dude, is just like a death trap because it's where everything is very valuable. Like, oh, this is where Pack-A-Punch is. This is where the level three armor is. You have to be down there pretty often. But it's very easy to get caught because there's so many windows and you can't do anything to stop the zombies. So there's windows everywhere. They're pouring out from either end. So there's no like loop that you can run to like put them on a train, mow them down and give yourself some time to breathe. You'll literally be shooting and back up in to one of the groups of zombies behind you. And so there isn't really a, at least in my experience, a right way to do it. There's strategy for sure, but um, I don't know. It's better. It's better than what I played on on Liberty Falls. I like that there was a little more strategy. Uh, there was the feeling of like, I can go out on a boat. I can swim. And there was more freedom in that way. Um, less complaints than the original. But yeah, I, I just didn't like the map layout as much so that was like my only updated thoughts on black ops 6 just want to let people know i went to the other side of the zombie spectrum i liked it more than liberty falls for sure liberty falls i'm like this map's just not like by like right away just from when i was playing this other one just opening the first set of doors and just oh this is zombies right like cool uh the only thing is again i think pace is everything in zombies i love maybe i'm I'm wrong on this and i'll totally take my out but I love the slow buildup in zombies and I feel like they hasten that completely. Like, I love the early beginnings. Like you just got a pistol and a knife and you have to work to that mystery box. And like those first sets of rooms are like everything matters. But I feel like this game lets you off the chain so quickly in zombies where you just get amazing weapons. You pack a punch them quickly. Like even on their traditional zombies maps, you pack these weapons quickly. You get max armor. It's like, okay, okay, Time to survive. Like there is no pacing and buildup. And I think zombies is a lot about pace. There is that eventuality of a, a moment of, yes, like I have everything. Let's go. Like let's survive now. But I love it because I love the buildup because that's where all of the intensity and like this run matters builds up because it's like, oh my God, I actually got this gun. And oh my gosh, like it's actually packed three times. And I've, you know, I guess the other element they've added here is that you could increase the rarity, which you're going to want to do of these weapons. Like you're going to want to bring the rarity up to to purple or to orange, uh, at least purple. Uh, otherwise, these zombies just don't die. Um, they got health bars and stuff. I don't know. So there's, I'm boomering a little bit. I'll admit. You sound like boomerang, but, yeah, but, I, but I'm self aware. So I hope people can at least respect that. But yeah, I, I think that the pacing of this new era of zombies kind of sucks. And I, okay, I think, fair. I think they had something better previously old school. Okay. um and i haven't played re- if anyone could write in and let me know if there's zombies in the recent cod entries that has more of that traditional pace let me know because i've kind of been out of the game for a while with zombies and fair. i don't that's fair this didn't really light my fire to go and check out other maps but if there are more traditional zombie experiences i, I might give them a look when they hit game pass or something that'd be kind of fun for a night no doubt no doubt another thing you plan <laughs> yeah so death note killer within uh quick backstory right <laughs> Uh-oh. death note to me there's i'm actually wearing a shirt for the other piece of media that i would never change and that's star wars knights of the Old republic this is bastel on my chest by the way cog the the most wonderful character ever written Whew. now there's only two pieces of media that if you sat me down in a room and were like maddie what are you never changing right you're stubborn. Heels are in the ground. You look at it. You go, that is media perfection. It would be Star Wars Knights of the Republic. By the way, I'm talking from a storytelling angle. Got you. <laughs> I'm yeah, not including gameplay here. Okay, uh, I think it's enough. a very important distinction to make with very KOTOR in mind. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Knights of the Old Republic and Death Note. I think Death Note, like I think you would love Death Note. Like it is, Ooh. it is mental chess. It is brilliantly told brilliantly acted it's got classic moments throughout that are hilarious like it's got everything but more than anything is that 
mental battle between L and Kira is what defines this series, right? Like these two, like one's got the death note and he's writing people's names in it and they're dying. And the other is the lead investigator who's trying to find out who's got the death note. And they both know, like they both know they got each other nailed, but they're trying to expose each other's weaknesses in the show. And it's just an ex- a 32 episode show about that pretty much. And just can Kira get away with it? And it is beautiful. It is, it, it was so good. The ending really isn't cry worthy, but I cried at the end of it because I was like, that was perfect. So mm. I say all of that to say that Death Note is one of my favorite things ever and that this series has not ever had a game in the West. They have three games. Hang on. Let me grab it. Yeah, all right, let's go. He's going to go, go into the go digging in the crates, y'all. He's about to let us know what's going on, audio listeners. Right. He's going in the back. He growl. He's got it now. What he's got. He got three games here, right? Ooh, all on Nintendo DS. DS and okay. all of them. Here, I'll show this other side. Mm-hmm. You can kind of see all of them in Japanese. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. But I bought them anyway. <laughs> I, respect, I respect that. Yeah. That's dedication. Yeah, because I just wanted to have them in my collection. I don't know. Like, I'll be never be able to day. understand them. They're all visual novel style. Like, it's it's a failure from the start. But they're $40. <laughs> so I was like, screw it. Why not? Do it. Um, nonetheless, though, this is the first Western released Death Note video game. It's called Death Note Killer Within. And it's an Among Us style video game, which when this originally leaked, right, that there was going to be a Death Note game, like it was trademarked, it was from Bandai. I was like, okay, like best case scenario, visual novel, Danganronpa, Zero Escape inspired, spinoff story in the Death Note universe. Like, let's go crazy with this thing. What are they doing here? My other theory, I literally had a DM with my friend. I, I brought it back when they announced it. I said, I have this strong feeling this is going to be an Among Us style game. And I was right on the fucking money Um, because there's only so few ways that you can do Death Note. The exciting part, though, Cog, I'm sorry, I have so much context to build this up. No, I love it. The exciting part was, okay. number one, Death Note was like a 2006 anime. You must have some idea that's very unique and novel to be like, let's bring this thing back and do a game on it. Right. The, Mm. The other thing is, again, there's no other games in the West. So, again, you had to have had an idea here like there was just too many bells going off where i was like and three by the way my favorite is that oh you can't do a 3d arena fighter at this game there's no fighting in death note right there's no fighting so like i'm like this can be great man so they announce it the trailers you know a bunch of the finger puppets from the show running around and it's it's an among us style game 5v5 though so you have the l team which is the investigators who are trying to find who Kira is, the user of the death note. And then you have Kira and his followers who are the ones who are using the death note and trying to kill everyone. I will say this first and foremost, great fit, wonderful fit for the series. It, it's a really good idea. Um, I, I dig it, but there are some problems here. Like in among us, part of the fun is the tasks and like the variety of the tasks you do on the map that kind of distract you and, like how you communicate with people. But the only task you really do on the map is running around and interrogating people. And you just do that by using the right thumbstick. Uh, oh, I should also preface this game is free on PS plus. That's how I played it. Um, I also bought it though for the $20 special edition um, because I wanted to show Bandai like I will pay for a death note game. <laughs> Please give me something else. What death um, note? And it's $10 otherwise. So very cheap game overall. Um, but yeah, that's like the only task on the map that's one of the problems is it kind of gets boring because since there's only one task right and everyone is doing that same task if you see anybody not doing that task is like gee i I wonder who who's who done it it's so obvious so the deduction game isn't much of a deduction and what sucks is they do have cool systems around it like you know, as you get, as you gather evidence, as you, uh, or if you're on Kira's side and you're writing in the death note, as you bring in new world orders and you start sending like out dead bodies and stuff and people have to go and investigate them, you kind of mess up the map a little bit, right? Like you, you get people to scatter and, um, and then gather in certain places. And the benefit of that is you like run in, you'll collect their ID and then you, cause you have their ID. Now you're going to go write their name in the death note and, and, uh, and kill them off. And it, 
Dude, I will just say the MW2 lobbies are back in full force with this game. Oh, the toxicity is lit. Oh my <laughs> God, dude. The, I joined a room and I, had, I was muted, right? So game one, mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm going to troll a little bit, right? And I decide to just follow this dude around because I'm like, let's see how quickly people pick up on someone just acting out of ordinary, right? <laughs> so I start just following this dude. My username is Maddie. He's like, Maddie, get away from me. Get the fuck away from me. I, like, I hear this dude panicking because he's near me he thinks i'm kira trying to run him down and get his <laughs> ip to kill him yeah. and so right away after the round ends you know everyone's done their tasks they're like yo maddie was chasing me this dude was acting mad fucking weird like they start getting into it bro and and right when there's a disagreement they're like well why'd you say that hold on why'd you and everyone's sussing each other out <laughs> i cannot use the vernacular that they ended up using afterward but <laughs> This shit gets crazy, bro. And I'm just sitting there with the, the audio coming out of my controller, just smiling at my TV, listening to everyone destroy themselves. But this gets to the point of, like I said, the problem is there's such a lack of task variety. It kind of ruins the deduction game. And it just takes someone kind of being an idiot. Uh, yeah. Not in how I was playing, but just someone goofing off in the lobby to kind of throw off the deduction a little bit. Um, what's cool, though, is that you can like, if you think someone's on to you, like, yo, I think they know I'm Kira. Like, you could pass the death note to someone and be like, here, you take it. And so mm. when they go to get you, they actually might have had the right person, but you just saw through it. So again, Pass-off. good Pass-off. good systems, right? Mm-hmm. But minus the, the, the task, if someone leaves, which happens frequently, right? Like if you're in the middle of a game, someone gets caught and killed, whatever it may be, um, they leave the game. And pardon me. What happens when someone leaves the game is everyone gets booted back to the lobby and the game ends. Huh? This happened four times in one hour for oh, me. No. And so, and you don't get like, oh, hey, thanks for playing. Here's some XP. It's like, you just wasted your time. Oh, no. And that's bad. Yeah. And they were planning to like, apparently penalize people who are not, uh, who, who are frequent leaving, leave, frequently leaving. But it, what does this remind us of, Cog? Tekken 8. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. And, yeah. and and this is the only mode in the game, so it's like yeah. you yeah. can't have people leaving. By the way, it, who cares if someone leaves a lobby in a an Among Us style game when they're already dead? They can't right. talk. They can't do anything. So they want to go and play something else, maybe even. Yeah. Like you can't handcuff them to the game, right? right. That they That's hopefully true. get XP at the end of it all. It's ridiculous. Um, mm. and so that is what's hurting the game most in my experience is when you're playing in a room if it's with your friends yeah you can control that environment but when you're playing online like i got booted four times i was like this sucks man like it's an all right game um i wish there was more here i maybe wish it was a different game as well but that's like personal taste aside like objectively speaking it's a decent game um i love that it's 5v5 and like collecting evidence and stuff is cool or writing people's names in the death note is cool um but it, it really hurts itself here and uh I don't think this game has like super long legs, all things considered. So you, and no one was really asking for it or expecting it. So you really didn't have to rush it out. Mm. If and I don't know how this wasn't caught, but um, yeah, man, uh, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at with Death Note Killer Within. Cool idea, cool game. Not awful. Don't want to sell it to anyone low, especially if you mm-hmm. get it free on PS Plus. Like, yeah, it's a great free night with friends. Get some friends involved. Like, I think that's what they want. Um, even for 10 bucks, like, I think you'll get your money's worth if you, if you enjoy these style of games, like it's, it's well-made, it's just got a couple of decisions there. And I'm like, mm, holding it back from greatness. Yeah. That sounds like a server side issue. Almost like yeah. they, they didn't have any, anything in place that if a person leaves to bump the entire lobby back without, yeah, that's rough. So yeah. hopefully they, that gets addressed quickly in, in some type of patch, depending on the support they have. For sure. Cog, any other games you wanted to talk about before we move on here? No, that was just it, man. I mean, again, you know, the, the beauty of metaphor and and the dungeons. And, you know, I will say, you know, I've been having a lot of fun actually grinding and, and getting, you know, uh, I will say, like, again, another pro tip would be if you can, if you're in a dungeon where you handle in business, mm-hmm. what I've noticed is, like, I'll use that opportunity to scour on um, the map. And some of the best equipment in the oh, game. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, if you're dude. able to... Yeah, that dungeon out. I was telling you about, I found a hidden room with three chests. And this was a, a dungeon that was built around like these chests are all dummies. 
all three of them were not dummies and all three of them had amazing pieces of equipment. I was like, let's go. Oh, so good. And the combat is just so amazing. Like, yep. again, you really get tested on certain things. I, I'm absolutely loving it. But the story has now reached that part where I go, yeah. okay. Because I was like you in the beginning, man. I was like, it's okay. It's cool. Yeah, it's good. It's like, good. Wow. Right but even. I'm like, yeah. cool. You know, I like the setting, but nothing really hit. I even said like, yo, when is it going to get popping with your man? Mm. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what's up with, you know who I'm talking about, your man yeah. who's, who's playing a role in the white. Yeah. So I'm like, what's up with your man and out there? He's like, just, just, just hold tight, Kyle. Just, yeah. just. I'm like, all right. And I was like, yeah, th- this is some of the most cunning stuff I've I've seen in, in video. Oh, yeah, it, it's great. It's great. So yeah, salute the better for I'm at the end. And hopefully by next Duke, you will get my full review. I mean, not full review, but you will get my what my top level experience was and front to back. And fuck yeah. Yeah. We'll we, we, we get to it. We'll get cool. to it. I'm pumped for it. First order of business here, Cog. We have some updates on Call of Duty. This is the fun part, right? Because these numbers matter a lot, but we're also talking about the most impactful game potentially in Xbox history when you think about the trajectory of things like Game Pass and where it could end up if Call of Duty Black Ops 6 isn't like a massive success for it. So we have some updates on just how development timeline is going to work for Call of Duty, and then we're going to get into those numbers. First is from Activision's Call of Duty Senior VP and General Manager Matt Cox, who said this when it came to the development timeline for Call of Duty, quote, When you look at Treyarch and Raven, they have a history of working together within the Black Ops franchise going all the way back to 2010. You have this history with people you work with, and that ultimately shows when it comes to the finished product from a publishing and go-to-market standpoint, end quote. He also revealed that the series has sold over 500 million units. Now, I think this is important to note, obviously, because it suggests that Raven and Treyarch are going to be staying together, staying on that schedule, and Black Ops 6 famously now had that six-year development cycle, which got a lot done with. Now, more importantly, is what Satya had to say about Call of Duty. Quote, last week, uh, last week's launch, sorry, of Black Ops 6 was the biggest Call of Duty release ever, setting a record for day one players as well as Game Pass subscriber ads on launch day. And unit sales on PlayStation 5 and Steam were up 60% year over year, end quote. Now, Daniel Ahmad chimed in on this with some interesting information himself quote based on preliminary data i've seen it looks like paid unit sales were similar to mw3 with playstation and steam offsetting the decline on xbox but the launch into game pass added a significant number of players into the ecosystem via xbox and pc in other words they still generated a healthy amount from paid sales and are also benefiting from subscription revenue slash larger overall player base end quote Then GamesIndustry.biz stepped in with some interesting data saying that Call of Duty Black Ops 6 is down 15% compared to Modern Warfare 3 and 46% compared to Modern Warfare 2. Now, compared to MW3, it's up 30% on PS5, down 18% on PC, down 67% on Xbox, down 59% on PS4, kind of whatever there. And PS5 represents 70% of the sales, whereas Xbox is 10%. PS4 is 4%, and PC is 16%. Now, keep in mind that this does pertain to the region of the UK. So we have a number of write-ins here. Let's start off with Phil Walker. Hey, Dukes, we had a glance at Black Ops 6 performance on UK charts. It's going to be interesting data for Microsoft to parse over. We can argue all day if sales versus subscribers and exposure are more relevant to Xbox, but we do have to agree at the end it comes down to one hard figure, revenue. Do you believe that the large hit to full price sales can be recouped in Game Pass subs and microtransactions? There's also obviously the Vault Edition. And if not, is it sustainable long term to keep Call of Duty on Game Pass? Have a great day, you lovely lads. Thank you, Phil, for writing in. All right, Cog, what do you make of these numbers, dude? I mean, this is huge, and this has to be a success for Xbox. And obviously, it's one region, but seeing that Xbox sales are down a little bit, because of Game Pass was to be anticipated. We all knew that was going to be the case. It's really if subs and microtransactions can make up. What's your read of all of it? Early data points are coming in. We start to parse the information. What is happening? <laughs> it's interesting, right? Um, you know, the first thing is, like you said, the Xbox, we look at the overall, you know, comparison to how it did the last year. And then we're looking at as far as the overall, the way the money pot is structured. 
Mm-hmm. And before you had your PlayStation, your Steam, your Xbox. And now we have the down in the Xbox, right? So we're like, okay, that's interesting. You know, up in PlayStation Steam to offset down in Xbox. But the key thing on sales is also how many of those Xbox users that are not, that did not buy the game, mm-hmm. how many did they subscribe to Game Pass? What's that number, mm-hmm. right? That's another key. So to me, it seems like the early indications are that the offset is actually, it is offsetting because everything else is up. And even though this is down, but then you have the the Game Pass subscriber, the active users. And then the other key that we don't know is how much people are spending now that they are in Game Pass. So if you're in Game Pass and then you got the game, do you, did you get the vault edition? Mm -hmm. Did you, Are you spending microtransactions now because you feel you theoretically got it for free? Again, we're getting early signs of the data. We still don't have the complete picture. Now, I did think the uh, game industry.biz article was interesting because they they said that in the UK, Black Ops 6, 15% down compared to Modern Warfare 3 and 46% compared to Modern Warfare 2. And they, they break down from a percentage. Again, it's one of those things that I do feel it's still, I don't want to say it's early to call. We do have an idea But the key to me is, like I said, I need to know, like Phil said, we got to get that revenue. We got to get those Game Pass subscribers and we got to get those active users, these DAUs and them MAUs, because that's really what they care about. And and even to the point where I think me and you were talking offline, how Satya's bonuses and existence is tied to Game Pass active users. So we could talk sales on consoles all we want. If they end up having more active users than they had before, this is going to be a different conversation. So it's the short-term investment versus the long-term play here. And we just got to see how the data parses out. But we're starting to formulate right now what's happening. I want to see more information, more data. But what do you think? How how are we feeling about it? Is it still risky to you? Does it feel, you know, is this a bet? Like, what's your early... Yeah, early take is I can't say fully encouraged, right? But I'm not dooming. Um, the reason I fall in the middle, which I know is a little annoying to listen to, but I apologize. But the reason I fall a little in the middle is the comparables are MW3. Now, yes. MW3 was a down year for Call of Duty. It still was the number two selling game for 2023. But by and large, all the data we got across multiple regions was it was a down year for Call of Duty. Now, that was compared to a high year for Call of Duty beforehand. So it's actually really tough data to parse through. But if you're looking at it, in the recent window, it going 60% year over year from a low performing Call of Duty isn't too surprising. And what this could represent is a return to norm. And if that is the case, that is great news for Xbox because it means that their move has not changed really anything at all on how people approach Call of Duty, um, relatively speaking. I think maybe, and I could be wrong, based on the data we're seeing in just particular regions, they would have liked to have generated more sales on Xbox, but you know, if you're there and you're subscribed, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, but I thought, here's how I look at it, right? Is, are you going to subscribe for like a month of Game Pass or are you just going to buy it and move on, right? And I really thought that if this was to work in Xbox's favor is that they would see a massive sur- surge in subs, which they're claiming has happened here, but that most people would just say, I'm going to buy this. And the fact that the, quote, shooter box is getting outdone on like even PlayStation What that symbolizes to me is one particular failure that may not matter at the end of it all, but I still think it needs to be talked about, is that despite owning the IP, having marketing, people have not chosen your console, and you are the shooter box. And I do think there is something to be said about that, in that PlayStation fought tooth and nail for that marketing, lost it, obviously, because Xbox owns it now, and ends up selling more units by a significant margin again game pass is a huge factor here so i know for a lot of people i'm just spitting nothing to them but i really do have to take an honest assessment like steam is up playstation is up um and this isn't even comparable this is is this more like year over year they're up uh when they were all over the place and game pass wasn't a major factor so um i don't know for me man taking a look at it i feel like on a marketing level it feels like the impact may have been missed, but again, this is where does it matter if Xbox has two million more active users thanks to Game Pass versus two million more sales on PlayStation? I guess they win either way, 
Right. So maybe it doesn't matter. Again, maybe I'm just like talking my brain off here and none of this makes sense to anyone. But <laughs> no, that's kind of the emotional wheel I went through, which right. is why I'm in the middle. It's like I'm not calling it like, Phil, you right. did horrible. I'm not calling it a tremendous success yet. Cause again, right. I I learned my lesson with Xbox on that, right? <laughs> like I I'm not doing that either. So uh, I'm just trying to take an honest assessment of what is there. Mm-hmm. And I think Game Pass could be hitting them in the right way or the wrong way. It really depends once we get those types of numbers in. Yeah. We no, I, typically I, I do th- see. Oh, I'm sorry. Please. No, we'll see. You're good. No, no, I get where you're coming from. I just think, you know, the way my mind is conditioned optically, we always say sales, right? And how much did you sell on your platform? So I get where you're coming from, but I Mm -hmm. guess like the way I look at it is like their ecosystem is they really ideally would like you in Game Pass. Yeah. So the the key is this though. You said it earlier. It's okay to be in Game Pass and get the get the long term revenue, provided you have the retention. What you say, like, it, it, will will we after month two, month three, is that retention staying there? Because if you stay past the three, two, three months, you've beyond paid for the game now. Yeah. You've beyond now. And it now, and if you're living in it and you buy that skin and you buy that microtransaction, that's going to be, the. I think, Phil, is the revenue. We go alert. When we see how much more revenue they spent, that to, the, to them, they'll take that long play any day of the week but to your point if a dude just jump in i'm hot for the month i'm good (laughs) you know what i'm saying maybe that's not ideal for them long term for their strategy and even though yes playstation's up so steam's up and stuff like that and they're not getting in the game pass and and engaging in the way you thought they were it'll be interesting too this is fun but i will say that this is what i will say in defense of them because I always get killed for even saying that sentence. Of course, Carl's going to say <laughs> of course that. Gonna do that. Of course, he is. I love what they do. <laughs> but uh, I will say is we have to say that Game Pass so far, the Game Pass so far, has not necessarily cannibalized sales. Because I think that was the fear a lot of people had. Like, yo, it's going to cannibalize all sales. Now you can talk about the Xbox platform specifically on some levels, but as far as the overall pie, it didn't have this negative effect. To the point, like everything is down, so to speak. So it's just curious, curious data. You know, we, we still get more information. We're not complete, but we got a little sense to UK. Need some more US data. We need some more long term data. And we, we, it's going to come out. We're going to get it. But this is the biggest bet they've ever taken. And we will learn if this has paid off. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting time. And, and no doubt, I think what matters at the end of it all, which is why. I don't know if there's a massive conversation to have on it. What matters at the end of it all, which Microsoft has made very clear with how they've operated in the past is if that revenue number is up, it doesn't matter how they got there. As if it's up, they're going to keep doing their thing, right? That's what I, yeah. So at that point, we are arguing semantics. Right. And if we see that number's up, nothing's going to change then. Um, yeah. But but I think the, the best sign is for the question we were really having going, this is like, will this destabilize? the COD ecosystem? Will this, you know, uh, will we we see like a devaluing of the product and in turn, like if people go to Game Pass and what it's showing here is people are willing to pay for Call of Duty, which I think is a really good sign, especially if you're Xbox, you still get a cut of that. Um, but it's also just a, I don't want to word this. I think it's a good sign that we're going to have our cake and eat it too. Like where you want to yeah. play is where you want to play and that good this point. behemoth will outlast game pass and it hasn't dramatically changed the the economic situation surrounding it for better or for worse even maybe and i think that that's a win there right because that was my concern is like you have your golden goose you don't have to change it they risk changing it and maybe they get a bunch of game pass subs out of it but otherwise sales are up big time okay yeah. that's a huge win so no major major changes to something that already works i mean probably best possible outcome um and I think this also just reassures any concerns people had with Game Pass moving forward. So we'll see once the hard data comes in. I don't want to yeah. make too many assumptions, but the right thing. now, early data looks pretty solid, all things considered, where I don't see any major decisions going one way or the other. Uh, we did have this other right in here. I'm going to read it real quick and see if there's anything we can add. Mr. Scott, if you're nasty, Dukes of the Guarded Veil, according to Games Radar, 52% of US Series X and Series S Machines launched Call of Duty Black Ops 6 the Monday after release, shattering the previous 34% record. The game was also credited for drawing the single largest Game Pass editions in a day, and sales were up 60% year over year on Steam and PlayStation. I played the game, and wow, it is so damn good. 
I haven't played a Call of Duty in a while, but I'm shocked at how much fun I'm having. I might even buy some DLC, something I never would have considered a year ago. How does this success, if you agree, change the narrative surrounding Game Pass viability? Have a, I feel bad for Xbox because now Sony will be making all this money kind of day. So, Cog, any, any changes on the narrative surrounding Game Pass viability? Is the survival locked in now with everything <laughs> here that we've seen? Well, early early signs are good. That's all we're going to say. We're just going to say early signs. I'm not going to get too crazy. Mm. But, yeah, that, that's that's great. I mean, as far as, like, the, the percentage breakdown, as far as uh, how many, you know, they're shattering that record to 52% of Xbox's series machine. Like, 52% of the entire ecosystem is playing the game. Mm-hmm. Pretty, it's huge. Yeah. Huge. We can't minimize that. Like, yeah. that is that is insane. Like, it's like 10 million. something million players. He's oh, like, yeah. And, and at the end of the day, their bet is what they've always said is, you know, when you when you're in that ecosystem and you you're in, you you play that much on it, you tend to spend more. That seems to be the thing that they love to hang their hat at with um what you call it, with uh, uh, Xbox. So I just want to check right quick uh, doing some real time podcasting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so right there. Um, boom. Yeah. Number two. Number two right now. Damn, Fortnite is a beast. <laughs> Fortnite is number one Fortnite still? Fortnite is a beast. I'm looking right wow. now. As of right now, Fortnite is number one. God is number two. Wow. Fortnite is still a beast, bro. They must have a new season. I don't know. But look, wow. I will say, oh, let's say, and obviously, we, I mean, it's it's obvious if I go to Game Pass, what's the most played on Game Pass? It's probably, yeah. So, yeah. We'll see. Hold on. Let me look at top paid interest. Oh, no, bro. Top paid. They are number one in top paid game. Mm. One, two, three. It's the, the Vault Edition, Cross Gen Bundle, Vault Edition, and then three is Dragon Age Veilguard. Okay. The third is the fourth, number four, and Madden's number five. So they've got the top three spots on, on the page right in, in conjunction with the console in terms of, and also Game Pass. So look, early signs, it's good. Again, I want to see retention. I want to see as the months go by, how long does it stick? Also, when we get the Circana information, mm-hmm. I want to see that, you know, um, from month to month. We're going to learn more. We're going to learn more. But so far, early signs are very good on the bet. We just got to see if it's sustainable. Yeah. Time shall tell. Cog, we get into our next bit of news here. Some updates on Undead Labs. They've been a little chatty this week. Let's cover it. First, a little update on the team size of Undead Labs. Quote, you know, we're part of the first party organization at Microsoft. We're one of the largest content producing organizations in the world now. And we're well on our way to making State of Decay 3 where the games radar has estimated that the team is a size of 120 to 130 developers. And again, they're calling themselves one of the largest content producing, producing organizations. So they have quite the staff at their helm. And then undead labs also spoke on their recent rebranding that they've done saying we're well on our way to making state of decay three with a much greater level of ambition and support behind us from a studio standpoint. I felt that we needed to look at our branding to say, is the brand the way that we're presenting ourselves to the world measuring up to what our ambitions are around what we're trying to achieve with our game? And so that was sort of the origin. They kind of seem to hint that what they want to do is beyond the whole Undead Labs thing and kind of like seems like something not State of Decay related. That was the vibe I was getting. But any thoughts on what Undead Labs shared with us briefly here? The rebranding is interesting because um, I I agree with you, Uh, you know, it, it, it signals to me that they want to be more. Mm-hmm. This studio has a lot to prove, though. Like, it's yeah. getting to the point, it went from the cute, darling little story of a game, like, was it live arcade game from the indie scene, mm-hmm. to then State of Decay 2 was more ambitious, which had a lot of potential. And I remember interviewing the team at the time, but that team has completely changed. It's, this, yeah. this company, I mean, this studio has gone through so much restructuring. Yeah. And then, obviously, we finally got a look at, three right and it looked promising it looked good it looked graphical you know graphically nice and stuff like that you know they've got a lot to prove they still got a lot to prove i'm pulling for them um the rebrand to me tells me that i I do like this i do like that the other xbox game studios are pitching in helping out with tech and stuff dope i like that now you've got to execute a quality game and I am curious to see what you do outside of mm. being stuck to the State of Decay franchise. Can you do anything else? And that 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 team, I'm I'm very curious talent wise what's in that building to do that. So I'm pulling for them. State of Decay is one of my favorite games. I think it's still untapped potential that has not been realized yet. 
to me, it's walking dead the game yeah. with your own community and stuff like that. And I heard about a lot of the dynamic nature. I thought the Unreal Engine showing of it looked really good. It was a strong showing. Mm-hmm. We'll see. They, they've got to, They've got to land this plane, though. They, there's a lot of pressure on this studio. I'm not going to sit there. If, if I want to talk about concern, they're on the concern list yeah. as far as making a quality game. They've they've got past the hurdle of now. Okay, they showed us that what they've been working on because they were dark, quiet, and it was spooky. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But now you got to execute a good game. So we'll see. Absolutely. All right, Cog. Well, we'll see. But uh, we're cheering for them, hoping things turn out well. And now we move on to our final bit of news here. Coming soon to Xbox Game Pass, the Wave 1 lineup for November 2024 is looking pretty sharp here. We have Metal Slug Tactics Day 1 on Game Pass, as we discussed last week, Cloud, Console, and PC. StarCraft Remastered and StarCraft 2 Campaign Collection is available on PC Game Pass November 5th, so this will be out by the time you're listening to this. Go Mecha Ball is on Console Game Pass right now. It's available with Game Pass Standard November 6th as is Harold Halibut. The Rewinder is also available on console Game Pass, and Turnip Boy robs a bank, also on Game Pass on console. Like that name. Then, November 7th, you have Goat Simulator Remastered, arriving on cloud, PC, and Xbox Series consoles. And last but not least, is the next Microsoft Flight Simulator game in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2024, which is cloud, PC, and Xbox Series consoles, November 19th. However, we also have some exits from Game Pass, some significant ones at that. All on November 15th, you are going to be losing Dicey Dungeons, Dungeons 4, Goat Simulator, Like a Dragon Guide and the Man Who Erased His Name, Like a Dragon Ishin, Persona 5, Tactica, and Somerville. So Sega with three big exits. But Cog, anything here that's leaving that you're going to be missing? I think I know your answer. But <laughs> anything that's being added in that excites you here? Go play Somerville, y'all. I like mm-hmm. Somerville, man. Was it perfect? Did it have a little issue here and there? Yes, in mm-hmm. the beginning. But man, that game truly tells, well, I shouldn't say tell, emotes some really cool atmospheric story, storytelling, you know, man and his family in yeah. this wild world. Please play Somerville. Obviously, Persona 5. Look, man, I, I got to give me a curio. I, I, I did like the man who erased his name. Yeah. I did like it. You know, these are some good ones going. As far as the entering, boy, I, I, I'm not, I've never played StarCraft, mm-hmm. but this is a tremendous get. This is tremendous. And people don't realize. Huge for PC. Yeah. Oh, my, huge for PC. And in, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, either Korea, one of those Asian regions, this game is massive. Mm. So expect some some feedback there hopefully they get some traction there but yeah those are the those are the ones that i think are really and of course slug tactics we talked about that yeah. you know it's got that turn base we love that little you know pixel art style yeah very cool yeah and, oh, reviewed pretty well sim- as well yeah which is nice. i'm gonna try fly simulator because i i like the fact that they're at least trying to gamify it this time so i want to see how those portions work is it enough to keep my interest because graphically yeah. the things are look i just don't want to be flying to tokyo and that's it i want to do something now sure. <laughs> so sure. that's where i'm at with flight simulator i i love all the little rescue missions and yeah all that it stuff. has me interested as well because it yeah. is a little bit more gamified and these sim games always do manage to catch me so yeah it's got my interest i don't know if i'll yeah my, my focus is like there's a couple of games i want to buckle down on before the year yeah. ends and one of them is obviously metaphor another dude is batman arkham shadow like i want to see what's going on there i'm very i love the arkham series and i'm very curious about a vr like the reviews have been amazing like i haven't really played a vr game since assassin's creed nexus i'm like you know let me like i feel i got a good feeling about this one so there's some some i want to bang out before another big one like indiana jones or stalker 2 i'm interested in so i know i'm gonna be busy for the year and i think this is a business decision in the making i can feel it so as much as i want to check out microsoft flight sim 24 i might just dip my toe in the pool and nothing else Fair enough, fair enough. We'll you, you've got a lot on your plate. So I already know. Yeah, there's a lot. I, of, got, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff, dude. They're doing Dragon oh. Quest 3 HD. Can't wait for that. Oh, there's, there's I'm a lot of you because you got Veilguard done and you're working on Metal Gear. I mean, Metal 4 right now. Well, Let's, I don't know, man. I'm, I, I, I've am i beat less games this year compared to the last two years because I'm a weirdo and keep a list. However, everything I fe- I've played this year has been ridiculously long. Everything I've played. Like, there's, I, I think I've played like two or three games that were like under 10 hours, you know? <laughs> Like, there's just so many games. Like, if I went down the list, dude, actually, 
crazy. Let's I'll go there. Right. Let's hit the, let's hit the list. list right now. Let's do it. What's the list? I got the list for a reason. Hold on. Games that beat. A boy ready. Uh, Trails in a Daybreak, Final Fantasy VII oh, Rebirth, oh, God. Sandland, Dragon's Dogma 2, which was reasonably length, but still. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, Hellblade 2. I, I beat yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I killed you. T- yeah. I killed your game hours. Yeah. <laughs> Shadow of the Air Tree was way bigger than I expected. I played Sekiro this year. Star Wars Outlaws was reasonably sized, uh, mm-hmm. as was Space Marine 2. Uh, I did Shivering Isle this year as well. Oh, that's right. Go I got back. Lost in Dead Rising Deluxe Remaster. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else we got here? Dragon Age to Veil Guard was really long. Oh, so yeah. there was a decent amount of game. I got to brace up for that. How many hours was that? I got to brace up for Veil Guard. Veil Guard took me s- about 60. Okay. So shorter than metaphor, but still long. Yeah. 60 hours on 60 hours, bro. Yes. Okay. I mean, I, it's, it, there's a difference when you're enjoying it, right? Yeah. There's a huge difference when you're enjoying it. I'm looking at this list and like it, it's it's not as stacked as it usually is. I, I, actually, I didn't give it credit. There, there are some shorter games here. Astrobot, Sonic X Shadow Generations, Tekken mm-hmm. 8 is really That's short. Um, well, you didn't do... Um, uh, not that I'm blaming because you have so many games you play. You didn't do uh, Infinite Well? No. Oh, no, I didn't do Infinite man. Well. You had so much when you play. I got gaps on my, my, my gaming. Yeah. I can't, I can't talk. Yeah, it, it, it's yeah. been a tough year because the, the development of my game picked up a lot where it has ate some more of my time where I've had to be a little more selective with like reviews and whatnot, which typically I am able to not be. And I know it'll, like probably 2025, I'll have a better structure to my schedule and that'll be less of a problem. But this year was a little tough. Like it's I've been on normal guy hours where I'm like, well, we got two hours tonight. I'm like, fuck this, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sucks. But nonetheless, uh, good year for gaming. Yes. Um, I'm happy I had all of my hours logged in last year where I think it was a better year. All right. Well, speaking of great games, Game Pass pick of the week time and we're out of here. Cog. I had to shout this one out in the spirit of this Atlas game we're enjoying and try to get more people. We're trying to recruit, right? We're, we're trying to bring folks into the Atlas armed forces. And how else to do that but through the power of Game Pass? And obviously we're seeing Sega clean house. So that's a good time. You know, because we're seeing that like one year window playing in effect, right? Now's a good time to check out Persona 3 Reload. If you got that time, you got that cash, of course. Um, I think that this is a brilliant remake. And I have recommended this one in the past, but I'm revisiting it because if people are on the fence about metaphor, mechanically, these games are similar at first and they seemingly separate over time, but there are a lot of elements that if you're playing a persona 3 really and you're like man i like the social stuff i love the turn base i love the flow i love the style this is shared with metaphor and if you're looking to kind of feel it out a little bit as someone who's been enjoying metaphor a lot and obviously cog speaks for everyone here with how great it's been we want you on this journey with us but maybe you've not dabbled with an atlas game before so join the school life in Gekogon high school right get familiar with what's going on in an atlas game embrace that style even if it's against your 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 gaming taste right like some of you out there are like this isn't for me i don't want to play as a high school student and i get that and that's why you should try this out because then if you do end up saying i like the elements but not the vibe not the tone you got this serious fantasy game with the same elements sitting right there and i just made your purchase that much easier so think of this a bit like you know you're testing the draft pools a little bit before you make your selection and, I, and that's the angle I want to take. Persona 3 Reload is fantastic on its own. They added a lot of new stuff to the game. Kept a lot of old stuff that I have a problem with, but they added a lot of new stuff that um, I think does improve, like combat especially. Combat's amazing in that game. Um, and they did a really good job with it. Like visually speaking, it was it's, it's on a real engine game, which was different from the engine that Atlas usually works with on Persona games. So the fact that they still had that style, that flair, that feel was cool to see. Uh, and And the game sold ridiculously well, so... Come see what the buzz is all about and then get in on some metaphor re Fantasio Persona 3 Reload Game Pass pick of the week for me. Hello, keep that Atlas love going. And I will say this it, such stylish, such like so much care in there, a lot of the games, mm-hmm. just from the UI perspective and just just well, well designed stuff. So, yeah, man, I love it. You know, turn base is alive and well and it's high level, it's high quality. These are the they're the guys. I just I gotta I just gotta give it up. What, what is it? Studio? What's the name of the joint? Um. Uh. Oh my God. Why am I forgetting? Studio, Studio Zero. Zero. Studio Zero. Yeah. Studio Zero. Man. I, I gotta give like y'all got it. Y'all got it. When it in terms of oh, JRPG, yeah. y'all are the 
the cutting edge. You guys, everyone See, follows I, you. You're seeing what I mean by saying like they're coming for that Final Fantasy crown. Like they're yeah, it's at least on quality. Yeah, no disrespect. I, Final Fantasy, you're great, and it's yeah. real time action. But it, if you want to talk about the future of the genre, I look at remember I told you like when I used to talk about Jake Solomon and when you know the XCOM series and the evolution of the genre. Studio Zero is now the next mm. evolution. This is weaknesses turn like all this stuff is just great, and it's just. Yeah this combination of day night cycle like they've started this whole thing of people are now copying now i'm seeing it in turtles games and i'm saying yeah. like yeah. bro people are starting to understand the blueprint that these guys have laid they they don't they them dudes they are them dudes they they are him so salute to them studio zero man gotta give them their flowers 100 percent. so that's your game pass pick of the week and cog that is defining duke a xbox podcast episode 201 mm. what are we feeling for a hashtag this week Mm. A little scattered, a little all over the place. Yeah, we, a lot we, of subjects. What 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 stuck with you the most? Mm, we we definitely had some good ones. Obviously, the Black Ops, the whole situation there. So many news beats that were good, but we had a ton of news. Yeah, beats. we had a ton. Um, I don't know why I'm in this like uh like this newspaper vibe. I don't know why. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? I don't know. I'm, I'm in this weird space of like news and information. So I don't know how to word it. Like we could do newspaper DD. I know we haven't done that. Yeah. Like, like I'm in a news mode, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like we in the, you know, like the daily news, yeah, news yeah. newspaper DD. Let's do that. All right. Mm-hmm. Great pick. Ladies and gentlemen, you got this deep into the show. You want to let us know your thoughts. You can tag us on Twitter. I'm at G27 status. Cog is at Lord Cognito. Use the hashtag newspaper DD. Otherwise, we'll see you in the comment section on the video. Hashtag newspaper DD. Let us know your thoughts. Either way, thank you for listening to this episode. We're going to get on out of here. And we'll catch you next time around for episode 202 of Defining Duke, a Xbox podcast. Peace out. Defining Duke, an Xbox podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is recorded from the United States of America. The show is conceived by Matthew Mr. Matty Play Schroeder and me, Colin Moriarty, and is written and produced by Matthew Schroeder. Maddie's co-host is Barry Lord Cognito Eversley. Defining Duke's executive producer is Dustin Furman, and the show is edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's shows, including Defining Duke, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer support level on Patreon, and we're thankful for your kindness and generosity. 